people say, why would you put your, your documentary of Diary of a Disgraced Soldier? Well, the public sort of um, humiliation of being labelled a war criminal. And I agreed to that title because that's what I was labelled by the media. Oh yes, oh yes, you're gonna get it. I'm afraid to say the f government. The MP, David Miliband, last night on TV said, Oh, I'm totally proud of what Tony Blair... You danged a load of troops in a f***ing small area, a very small area, lots of Iraqis around, all wanted to f kill you. How am I supposed to act? Tell me! F***ing tell me! The media have had their say, the government have had their say, the army have had their say, and me, the soldier in the middle, I haven't, I haven't said shit yet. Martin, how are you, brother? How are you, Chris? I'm a bit hoarse, mate, as you can hear, but uh, that's not going to put us off. No. Um, so I'm going to ask my original question. Martin, how are you, mate? <laughs> I am really good. I'm really good. I'm, I'm um, just enjoying the weather now as summer's come in. It just feels like you can see spring, you know, breaking its way through. And it just feels exciting times. I've got lots of good things to look forward to this year. So, yeah, I'm, I'm in a good place. Yeah, definitely. So every now and again, I I just make contact with someone and it it, it feels like I'm, I've come home, you know? Yeah. Because there's so much nonsense in the world now. There's so much misunderstanding about what life is, what the narrative is and who controls it, that you you might know thousands of people and you know i've got what 160,000 i think on my social media including my youtube channel right yeah how many can you actually connect with to a point where you kind of see things you know along uh, along the along the same lines and uh, so just from our conversation so far, mate, it's, it's been great to meet you. Oh, thanks, Chris. I appreciate that, because I feel there's a lot of synchronicities in what we, we do, in a sense. So I'm doing, doing it within the art world and the film world, and you're doing it with your, with your podcast, which I've been watching. And, and when you contacted me, I was, well, was honoured, really. I was like, oh, great. I'm really glad that you're interested in speaking to me, because uh, I've been making films now since, uh, since I got out of the army in 2007, and... There, there doesn't seem to be a lot of interest in what I sort of do. Um, I'm, I'm hopefully the voice of the military trying to sort of put out um, product into the world that, that shows an accuracy, an accuracy of, of war um, rather than, than what's been portrayed in the past. You know, And I did want to ask your opinion when you watched Diary of a Disgraced Soldier, what you sort of, what you thought of it? Oh, mate, I'm... <laughs> I was shocked if I was honest. Right. But not not at the behaviours, because I'm I'm former military. I, I know what happens in the military, mate, you know. I know what goes yeah. on and and <clears throat> I know what can happen in conflict. But I was like shocked isn't the right word. I was like hurt to the core by what what you had to go through. Um, so for our friends at home, who's the chap we've got to thank for putting us in touch, Martin? I, I got too many people to remember. Anthony, Anthony, I won't say his second name, but Anthony contacted me, um, yeah. and he, he, he's, a, he, he's a lovely chap. Um, he's ex forces himself, and uh, I know he lost his partner and he came to me because I've been a therapist for the last 10 years as well, so you know, um. So that's how I met him through doing my therapy and we helped each other. You know, I did a bit of work yeah. with him. So he's uh, uh, on my social media, got a hold of me. Hi, Chris, you've got to meet my friend Martin. And uh, he he sent me the link to your promo film, right? Or, or it was something like yeah, that. Yeah, 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 yeah. And um, again, for our friends at home, so... Martin is the chap that filmed that, uh, let's just call it a memorable clip of Iraqi civilians uh, 
getting what appeared to be what was a bit a bit of a beating by British soldiers. At the That's time, right, yeah. at the time, it it was obviously blown sky high by the media. Um, this situation where you you send our young men and women off to war, then you pretend it's all like freaking jolly hockey sticks and cream scones on a Sunday and cucumber sandwiches when in actual fact it's just the most brutal thing a person can it can experience or you know not not everyone that goes to war but and uh I will hold my hand up and say when I first saw that footage and because of the power of the media it really just seems like oh my god this is British soldiers behaving badly, you know? What mm -hmm. are they doing? Oh, lads, you're letting us down. When I watched your, uh, your, your documentary, again, Friends at Home, Martin's made um, a film and a documentary. We're going we're gonna to talk more about that and put links. But I just felt for you, the way it had been completely spun. Yeah all of the backstory and, and the context stripped out of it to make it look like you were the biggest you-know-what on the planet, you know, a little bit sort of mental as opposed to soldiers at the absolute thick end of battle who've been, who've been um, under constant attack for days and days and days. There's even a grenade going off in the footage, but this is a grenade. And not just that, you're surrounded by mobs, angry mobs, many of whom have weapons, even if that's just a, I say just, even that's a catapult. I nearly had my eye taken out by a by cherry stone, believe it or not, in uh, Pakistan. Lethal. In, yeah, lethal. Yeah, in Pakistan. And the guy just flicked it like that and it hit me right in the eye, bang on, didn't have time to close my eye. These guys are firing at you with, with. Um, I remember my Black Widow catapult when I was a kid, they're lethal. Could kill you. And, and of course, and of course, as I say, that's the minimum of weapons. You're under, you're facing up for days on end. And then of course, what came out of it? And then when I watched your, your documentary, I just felt your frustration at the utter crock of you know what that is, is, it's not just the British system, it's a global agenda that keeps pushing these, um, these narratives. The forever that, wars. Yeah, the forever wars, the same story trolled out again and again knowing that the the vast majority of the public who just get their information from mainstream media will go i think it's called hegelian dialect problem you create the problem that creates a reaction like what are we going to do about this problem and then of course um let's just say certain elements come up with a solution which is let's go and smash the you know what out of some underdeveloped country at the same time as installing our our puppet government and uh grabbing a hold of, of the economy and the natural resources etc etc but just to finish uh, uh, my sort of part of the intro martin when you're in a car and you were so frustrated it was so powerful you know, this is your frustration is how everybody should be. Everybody. And yet most are walking through this Orwellian nightmare. And actually, you know, if the photographs people are, are putting on their Facebooks is anything, they're celebrating it. They're celebrating it. We've yeah. all lost our freedom. And I think. I think what you summed up the, the, the film and my frustrations and, and hearing you talk about it, I watched some of it the other day. And for me, watching myself back, it's hard to watch it because 
I wouldn't say that I'm, I'm a million miles from there because they, they, those you know frustrations are still still there, especially the last year we've 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 just been through. Um, especially when it's what we've what we what was it all for? What we fought this for? Now, what what I was getting at was the the frustrations of of what what have we fought this for? And, and, and what when I look at Die of a Disgrace Soldier, I've spent the last ten years as a therapist trying to figure out who I, who I, who I am. And and now I feel like I'm, I mean you're always constantly working out you are you're, you're you're constantly looking at back and reviewing and what, through Diary of a Disgraced Soldier I couldn't have made that film any better it's just untucked frustration of what what I'd been through and watching some of your other podcasts of guys that you know were at Danny Boy Chuck Point and stuff like that and hearing what they went through the public sort of um, humiliation of being labelled a war criminal and people say why would you put your your documentary of Diary of a Disgraced Soldier well I agreed to that title because that's what I was labelled by the media you know that's what I was labelled and that's what I came back from the military with so it didn't matter the 12 years of serving in two tours of Northern Ireland or a tour of Sierra Leone and a tour of Iraq and all the other operations I've been on it, it, it was you're only remembered for your last performance and my last performance was was that in Iraq so that's how I was always sort of judged. And the 10 years of therapy that I went through, it was getting to a point of being at peace for myself. And that's the thing, when you get to a place, and this, this goes for anyone out there suffering with mental health, if you can get to a place of peace for yourself and know it doesn't matter what anybody thinks of you, it's what you think of yourself, that's all that matters. If, if anyone watches podcasts, it saves a life in the sense of finding that place of peace. It does not matter what anyone, what the media think of you, what your family think of you, what your best friends are, is what you think of yourself is what's going to get you through PTSD, through that journey, if you're going through, you know, self-worth issues. But what I, what I wanted to talk about was, there's a lot of violence in, in Diary of a Disgrace, so a lot of expressive violence, and where, where did all that start? And as I went through my journey of therapy, it, it goes back to, like my, my growing up, I, mean, I was really fortunate to have a good mum and dad and that's kept me, and I've got great family now, you know, my partner and I'm in a very loving, stable lifestyle that, that I'm very fortunate to have and there's a lot of people that don't have that. But there was a series of events that happened to me going from my childhood up to the military where, and, and all the way up to the, the catalyst of when I got caught on that video saying what I was saying. Of, of the journey of getting there, of just being like a caged animal, if you like. So if I if I go back to where, I, where it first began, I grew up in Cornwall, um, you know, on a council estate, and I, I would have put myself down as a bit of a nerd. I was into comics. I was into, you know, superheroes. And my friend, he was also the same. He was into comics and superheroes. And we grew up on a council estate where, violence was an everyday thing and I, I my mum and dad were so protective they wouldn't let me out of the garden so I got let out of the garden once because this lad took me off and I remember being tortured for about what seemed probably was probably about 20 minutes seemed like two hours where I was made to pray for my life and going through that at the age of seven where I was made to pray for my life and I was I was like I, I thought I was going to die you know he was whipping me with sticks maybe pray for my life and loads of people in the state were looking for me and eventually released me and I come out of that situation and then several I don't know a year later or whatever I'm with my friend Shane who was slightly older than me and we go down to take some um oh, we'll say it, the old corona bottles he used to take the corona bottles got got 10p back he used to get some penny sweets so we come out of the shop and there was a load of skinheads outside so we go back in the shop we're hiding in the shop and then we go back out and Shane says, so we go around the other way. And I was like, no, then we go around the corner and there they are. It was like growing up on, you know, Shane Meadows, this is England. Skinheads everywhere. Wanting to... So we got this, this we got this lane. They, they let me go through and they smashed milk. The milk bottles we just bought, they smashed them over my mate Shane's head. They kicked all of his braces in up through his face. I remember watching that at the age of eight or nine and just seeing this, this gratuitous violence, like stamping on his head. Um, and just having that impact on me. And then they gave me a couple of punches but because I was younger, they, they gave some sort of compassion to me. And then the police were involved and then 
several weeks later, I'm on my bike on the estate. One of the, the lads who beat us up, beat up Shane, came up said, I want your bike. I was like, no, you can't have my bike. All right, I'll give it to him. Then he rides it around. I said, can I have it back now? He's like, no, he punches me in the face and throws my bike down the, down the hill. And it was just this, growing up on a council, like this, this constant violence. And I got to a point where I was like, no one is ever doing that to me again. And I just became focused totally on how I could destroy someone before and prevent that from ever happening to me again. Nobody will ever punish me, abuse me, punch me. So I just, I watched everything. I went to boxing training. I just became so aggressive that once I got my first job, which was working for co-op, first time a shoplifter would steal something in the shop, I beat the shit out of that shoplifter. Wearing, wearing the co-op red gown with a bow tie. And then the manager pulling me in saying, you can't behave like this. You're going to have to go in the military because you're so violent. You're so aggressive. You need to channel and focus your energy into something else. So I went into the army. Sorry, before that, I went to art school. So while I was at co-op, I went to art school and, and I found art school really, like, I was around academics, basically, people who just wanted to be, like, um, you know, students and very intelligent people. And there was me coming from a rough, um, aggressive council state. And then with these people that were, that I admire their intelligence. I admire their way of being able to express themselves through art. And I just still had all this violence inside of me. So going in the military at the time just seemed like the only thing that I could channel and focus on. When I got into the military, I found the harder you work, the harder you train, the more aggressive you are, the more they promote you, the more that they, channel and, and go, this guy's a mate, he's, he's, he's willing to, to, to do this, he's willing to do that, he's willing, and, and they just push you towards, you know, getting rank and getting promoted. And I just felt like I found my family with more violent, <laughs> aggressive individuals. And we just became, well, when I joined One Eli, um, I found the basic training, you know, people will say like you've got your you know your special forces you've got your commandos and your powers and that i mean for me the training that i went through with a lot of infantry was it was brutal our basic training was at the time it was all the deep cut murders that were going on sorry I shouldn't say that but the deep cut incidents that were taking place and do you want to, do you want to explain that for our friends at home well yeah the, this was in the 90s there was a number of killings that that took place uh, some some soldier i think was like shot in the head with the saa or and they said it was suicide. Well, you know yourself holding an SAA, or you probably had the SLR, I don't know. But to, to, to shoot yourself in the head with a... Crazy. Are you trying to say I'm old? <laughs> so, so yeah, the um, the whole basic training, I remember being on exercise in, in, um, in Winchester, and we did the escape and evasion, and, you know, for a whole night, we were being pursued by... By the screws and, and I was thinking no they're gonna they're gonna kill us you know they're gonna actually kill us <laughs> they were so aggressive with our you know and they caught a couple of my friends and I could hear them like like I could hear my friends crying like like that and they were getting peed on they had sandbags put on their heads all this stuff that was going on like of how to process prisoners was being taught to us sandbags on the head plastic cuffs put behind the back putting your legs put into stress position all this stuff was just it was just conditioning it was just training you know, I've got, hey, listen, I've got no grievance again. We had the best corporals ever, and they were preparing us for to be violent individuals, channel focused violent individuals to take on scenarios in Northern Ireland. When you're going up against the IRA, you know, it, it, as a 19 year old lad and going into bandit country where you've got the legends of Slad Murphy and Fixing you know, like these people that have got like eight or nine can you know confirmed kills of british soldiers on their belt and they're looking at you and they're looking at you like these people were you know as terrorists go they're the best on the planet and we're there to try and p check them you know personally check these people or so did all my basic training went out to northern ireland in 96 which was my first tour went out to kidi middletown and the first thing I confronted with was harder people again, a lot harder people that, that, so I was lucky enough to have a guy in my section who was a, it was a boxing trainer, ABA level boxing trainer. And he, he trained me because I could hear my friend getting beaten up every night in his room. 
So I just offered to be this guy's punch bag. And I remember just being in the drying room. I remember the old drying room with the hooks. <laughs> and that was our boxing ring, literally. You know, if you go if you go against the hooks, the hooks be stabbing in the back of your head. And I remember getting walloped. I've never been hit so hard in my life by a guy called Scott Harrison from Leeds. And he punched me and I saw stars and I thought, it was just that conditioning myself to be in a violent situation all the time, constantly violence, violence, violence. So by getting good at boxing was a way of, of and then they were recruiting while well, I was in Northern Ireland and that tour, because nothing really scary happened to me. On It was more, when people talk about Northern Ireland, what was the scariest element of Northern Ireland? One of it was the training, it was the beat up training. Your pump was so much fear before you go out to Northern Ireland showing you know, like the signals, the two signals that got caught, video, the, you know, the, doing all the IED training and just the countless scenarios you go through with, um, I did all my uh, Northern Ireland training at Barry Kindler, Bally Kindler, and it was just, I remember it being so, so scary, you know, like the sense of like what the IRA could do to you if they put a device in here. And we were learning from all the guys that had been through the eighties and the seventies and these guys were, were were teaching us everything they knew, preparing us for eventually what would be Iraq and stuff. So we were getting all this 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 counterterrorism training. It was phenomenal. And one and I were so professional. They they had, I think at the time they had the most tours. I don't don't quote me on that, but they had the most consecutive tours of Northern Ireland. So not one and I and two and I had literally you know been doing it every 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 year, every two years. They they were sending a battalion out to especially around um, um, the borders. And I was, is <laughs> a Northern Ireland, I'll just get a little Northern Ireland story for you. I remember getting out there and being so petrified of what could happen, didn't happen, but what could happen. Proxy bombs, remember the old proxy bombs and being talked about and being mortal attacked. And all I then remember was just stagging on and just looking at fields for hours and blokes doing <laughs> things in sangers that you probably wouldn't want to imagine. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, so so I just remember Northern Ireland being, I remember t- my t- turning, up, turning up on my first team and they said, right, you're going to be Antler Man. No, I was lucky that I was White Sifter Man, so I didn't. Uh, and then I was team, I had to take the team med pack. I had to take the cow trops. The cow trops were, I had to have the IV and all that lot. And by the time I put all this in my day sack, because you weren't allowed to take it for a free day off for a patrol, they said, oh, just take a day sack, don't take a full, your full Bergen. So in my day sack, I had to buy myself from Silverman's catalogue. I had all this stuff going in. I could just cram a warm jumper in the top. I said, where am I going to put my sleeping bag? And they said, that's not our problem, Crow. <laughs> so my free day operation going out on an overwatch I had nowhere to put my sleeping bag so I had to just take I just took a warm top and I remember just lying between two squaddies just all night just shivering myself to sleep <laughs> I could take a bivy bag I had a bivy bag that was it so I had a bivy bag and uh, and I just remember that brutality of like what have I joined this is just hell how can I get out of this you know and then watching some house for three nights um but then the, I got selected for the for the boxing team, got put on the boxing team, uh, the regimental boxing team. And I always remember that guy that gave me that big wallet when Hi. we were doing the trials. Yeah. Can we just explain for our audience, because I know there'll be people wanting to know those terms. So Sanger is, is your sentry box up on like your watchtower. Yeah. Cow throps, they're, they're the vehicle spikes, aren't they? To take They were just like, yeah, rusty chains with spikes on them. And then they just weighed a ton. Like about, there must have been about 10 links, a big fat chain. And then you would put a bit of um, rope on it. And then you would just stand in the, in the hedge and get, and if they said um, runaway car, you would just pull it across the road and probably not hold on to it because it ripped your hand off. And let's just say, White sifter, we're not going to explain because that's no, that's uh, oh, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. So, so, um, yeah, just don't stand outside someone's house, <laughs> anyway. So, 
So I just remember Northern Ireland just being a catalyst of frustration. And coming back from Northern Ireland, I was I've been selected for the regimental boxing team. Um, so I was really proud about that. That's that got me out of the platoon and got me into with another team of really severe hard bastards. And we were allowed to wear the you know the regimental tracksuit. So it got me out of duties and all the best food. Um, but then a lot of animosity towards me that. So then I, I started to have to take out several members of my company who were like, it, the only way I can explain it, barrack life, because when you come back from, from operations, is it's like being in prison. No, I've never been into prison and I'm touch with I never like to go to prison. But the violence in, in a battalion when the battalion's not away, when you've got bored troops, you probably have the same in the Marines, bored troops, for, for weeks, you know, that Monday to Friday, if they're normal bat battalion life, regimental duties, literally, they'll be doing in-house training, but in the evenings, in their own time, it'd be blokes going out, getting drunk, coming back, beating up the younger lads, torturing the young lads, and it was just abuse, you know? And I remember being in Colchester, just like, lending, someone said, can I borrow your helmet? Brought it back, and it's covered in cam cream and shit, and I said, you're not going to clean it? Like, and he went, no. And like, so I just smashed it around his head and beat him, you know, several times around the face with the helmet. And I said to everyone, when you, you want to borrow my kit, this is, what, this is how you end up. And then a mate saying to me, look, you've only been a year, you can't really start filling people in. I said, well, how long do you have to be in before you can start chilling people, you know? And, and, and then someone else came in my room and said, like, ball these boots. And I said, I'm not bullying your boots. And then smashed them around his head and then trying to gouge his eyes out with my thumbs. And I just, I, I remember just getting to a point where I, everything that was, was about violence, 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 violence. And my sergeant pulled me off him and they took me outside and he just said, right, Private Webster, what was that about? And I said, he just asked me to bull his boots. Steve-O, is that true? He went, yeah. He said, right, have you learned your lesson? Don't come back into these lines. If you do, I'll be chinning you next time. And I was just, it was almost like a license to just beat people up. And, I, and I, in my mind, I was like, but now this is like the best job I could ever be in. You know, violent bullies, I could just smash up and, and, and people are going to award me by that. You know, remember the platoon sergeant was like, if anyone, you know, is that line, as long as you're working with the sergeant and work, working against him, they could use you to regulate the troops, you know, use your violence. So I became a very sort of violent, aggressive person. I have respect as well for, those, for other sort of, you know, I wasn't, a, I wouldn't, I hope I wasn't a bully. I'm sure I'll come across at the time there'll be people out there who serve me to probably say I was, you know, but the, the, the catalogue of violence going in the army and, and, and everything was about chinning someone, beating someone up. I wasn't interested in girlfriends. All I was interested in was, was just breaking jaws and hurting someone. And, 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 and obviously I didn't like, I didn't like who I'd become because I couldn't really be myself. And it was the catalogue of violence of growing up to where I'd become in the army was, this is who I am, I suppose. So Saturday night out, go out, and I would call it treating myself. Me and Jay would go out, another lad from Cornwall, and all we'd be looking for was to just to break someone's jaw, knock someone out, and what we call civvy bashing, you know. And I, I think... At that point, I knew I had a problem. And my dad saying to me, Martin, you, you're going to have to change your ways because you live by the sword, you die by the sword. And I was, wasn't was hearing the message until I got arrested and then the rest of my battalion were going out to, to, to Cyprus. And I was going to miss out on this because I'd been caught. So we, our regiment was still based in Colchester and I was going back on two ABH charges. So And my brother was involved in one of them. So we were both facing prison sentences and... I had to pay for my own tickets back to Cyprus. The military wouldn't pay for that, which I don't blame them. And I came back and because of my service in Northern Ireland, that sort of saved my ass really. Went to Crown Court, uh, got in front of the, 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 um, the judge and pleaded not guilty to one of them and guilty to the other. And the judge turned around to me and the jury convicted, uh, found me not guilty of one of them and which... Um, I probably, I probably did do it. I was drunk at the time, but it was just, I just was in the darkest place ever. And I, I wanted to, I didn't want to be around. I was suicidal. And I thought, what a mess I've made in my life. And the judge goes, look, I'm going to make a decision today. 
He says, I'm going to allow you to walk and I know the military will punish you. He said, but if I ever see you in this courtroom again, I will not hesitate to send you down for a custodial sentence for at least five years. Do you understand? I was like, yeah, thank you so much. Got out, got a mortgage, got my shit together, went to my Lance Corporal, started to really sort of progress forward and um, went out to Sierra Leone. That tour was, um, was pretty intense. And then um, I think more and more with it, Sierra Leone was just seeing the level of brutality in Africa and in, a, in, a, in an African city, you know, just driving past and seeing a dead body rotting on the road like it was like a dead pheasant or something. You know, and, and no one bothering to identify this person. It's just that the the way human life is not respected in done a few tours of Jordan, did the Falklands, and wow, that was an eye opener to see what those guys fought in massive respect. Um what kind of stuff did you see down there, mate? Can you was it we, we've in the done, Falklands? We've done quite a few Falklands podcasts and I, I Mate, I find it hard to get through them without getting emotional. I, I, I would find if, if, as a filmmaker, if I can, if, if I, if I'm blessed enough, I love to make Goose Green, and I've even scoped it because I've been to Goose Green and I saw it. And what I was taken back by was just how underwhelming. And I'm not saying this to disrespect how there's no cover. It's so. It's when you get there, you think this can't be Goose Green. You expect this grand, you know, it's literally like a not the only way I describe it, it looked like a knoll on top of a hill, not a very big knoll, you know, there's just no cover. And you think, where would you dig in it? Where would you hide with the bullets coming down? I just think, and we we got given all this, we got given all this warm kit, deputy dog hats. You remember them with the the gate hanging, the hands, the mitts, you probably had them for Norwegian training. And we was like, we're wearing this stuff, we look like right crows, we're like, like right. Um, idiots wearing this. So as soon as we got down there, we had it from the full kit. We had it at Gore-Tex. Deputy dog hats. You could only identify everyone by their eyes. And we were like, how did they fight in this shit? It was like that 80s generation were like, they were, I could describe it, probably didn't grow up with central heating. They were, they were, they were, they were a harder generation of, of, and that's not taken away from the guys that fought in Afghanistan, which I wasn't part of, but there was something about that, that the whole of the Falklands was like, wow, man, what they did there was just another superhuman effort. Mm. You know, anyone that went there, superhuman effort. It was just, because I was in mortars and we were trying to find mortars. You couldn't fire no more than two, two rounds without, if you fired a 51, literally, boom, that, the, the depth it would go down would be, literally the barrel would be, at the, the, the surface area. So when you fire mortars, you couldn't fire, you couldn't fire any more than you can't bed in. So we had to do these things called ration bags. And it was like, well, so that straight away takes away any form of like 81 millimeter away from their, their usage. And it's just, it's just like, going, have you been to parts of Fermanagh in Northern Ireland uh, that used to get like jelly, like a whole, have you ever come across like a whole, in Northern Ireland, used to come across like real boggy areas. And I know people talked about the bogs of Fermanagh. I never saw it, but in Northern Ireland, people said, oh, this is similar to Fermanagh ground, where you can find a whole field and you go like that and you jump on it and it all just wobbles. It's like jelly. That's the only way I can describe it. Have you ever come across it? It's like peach. I've, I've come across it on my travels around the world. I've, I was in the city in, in, in Northern Ireland. Yeah. Um, yeah, they, they put us up in a five star hotel for our for our tour. Um, <laughs> not. <laughs> um, so, um, but uh, so, yeah. no, I, I I I know exactly what you mean. For, for what they did in, in in the Falklands for me is I just really hope I get to 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 work with. I'd love to interview some of the paras and Royal Marines and and. and make a generic film that sort of not just covers the land trips. I all wrote, I've already written a script for, for um, a film about, uh, because I've been there from my experiences and I'm then trying to, support, what I'd like to do is, is interview Paris to try and get did true you, stories mixed into. Did you see my podcast with Spud, Spud Ely? Yeah, I did. I was listening to that. Yeah. Quite, uh, I, I was interested when, when he was talking, when he was talking about watching, watching the ships go up from his, was he, he's an OP, wasn't he? Wasn't he talking about, he was in an OP and he said he was seeing the, 
the ship's burning, and he's like, what the hell? He, he's the one that announced that the BBC announced it, that they were forming up before Goose Green, which made me, made me really upset when I heard that, because I had the same experience with the BBC, with how they portrayed me and how they portrayed um, all of us, you know, from, from Iraq. And there's always been that, the enemy within, from, from the BBC. And the thing is, I know some really good people in the BBC as well. It's not to tar them all with the same brush. It's like anything, isn't it? It's like any organisation, you get good and bad people. Because I do know some good people. No, let's just, Martin, let's just say it how it is. You know, it, it's an evil organisation run. It, it is the mouthpiece of the sociopaths. That's all it yeah. is. Are they good people? Yeah, of course there are. It's the same yeah. way as... It's the same way in the military. Most of us were, were good guys, but the overall role in the structure of when you look at the a global holistic perspective of what war is, what the military industrial complex is, you know. Um, sorry, I, it, 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 it's, it's all just so prevalent at the moment. And I don't think people understand that everything you're talking about ties, ties I mean, into what's going on today with mouthpieces like the BBC have conditioned us to think everything is separate and you know you know the, the, the scenario that I look at with the Iraq war which I'll come to in a minute is what Tony Blair did was he cried he's the boy that cried wolf and what he did was he used an asset the, the fact is that never again would the British public ever ever trust any intelligence that comes from the government or from the media, right, to, 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 so if we are really in serious, serious threat, how are we going to get that information? Because it's being used. They've, they've pulled the cord, right? You know, World War II, it was essential for us to fight and stand up for our country, and war was a necessary force to be used. And now what we've done is, because of the forever wars, we've, we've blown that force. And now good people like myself and all the next generation, they're not going to join up because they, they realise that the, the government and the, and they, the, uh, like the powers that be have you have cried wolf. The boy that cries wolf told lots and lots of lies for their own personal gain and used what is the, the greatest military that's ever lived for the wrong reasons and left this sour taste in everyone's mouth. I sold my medals, you know, I sold my medals because I was so angry at what, you know, I'd love to get my medals back now looking back at it, but I would look, because I felt like, well, no, why, it wasn't me that told those fibs, it was, it was the power, it was my, you know, what they say, um, lions led by donkeys, it was led by sociopaths who, who had an agenda, their own personal agenda, Mark, but people said to me, "Would you know what, what's what's Tony Blair's karma? For? The type, the karma that Tony Blair faces now is the fact that no one will ever take anything he ever says. For he, he was the apparently the man of the people, and I was pleased when he got in. But now his his words mean nothing. They only mean something to the to the oligarchs and the business people that pay him millions to do a di after dinner speech. But he could never speak to the people now. That, whatever he says now, the people go against." So that that's his that's his karma that's his punishment. He signed the Faustian Pact, didn't he? He signed his soul to the devil for what he considered was success. He will get that for the rest. He will get the the millions in his bank. But and it's it's crazy because what happened in Ireland, you know, with Mo Moland and the work that she because he took the credit for what Mo Moland had done, bringing those you know those guys to the peace table, Adams and and um, Guinness and. Uh, Never, never, never. What was his name? Um, Paisley and all those people. Yeah. He brought those, she brought those people to the table and Tony Blair took the credit for, took the credit for that. And, but, but going back to my story, so building up to Iraq, done two tours of Northern Ireland, tour of Sierra Leone. So it was pretty, we were, the, the, the second tour of Northern Ireland was pretty ferocious because we were used on Porter Down Bridge. So the more happened, so in, in 2000, under the Northern Ireland Peace uh, Agreement, the, was it East of, was it the uh, Good Friday Agreement? They released Johnny Adair, they released the Red, you know, all of the, the, the IRA suspects that have been for years at the Mays Prison, released all of those, those, those um, hardcore um, paramilitary fighters have been released into Northern Ireland 
and you had the Gavaki Road in Northern Ireland. Have you heard of the Gavaki Road? No. Um, in uh, in Porter Down, and what it is, it's it's basically a Catholic, a staunch Catholic area, and every year the Orange Men want to march through that. So what what they do, the the um, Porter Down Bridge is the church. And on the on the where the church is and the churchyard is, there's this little tiny little bridge, and that's where the parade starts. And then they walk down across this bridge, and then they walk through the Gavaki Road. And what happened every? I don't know if it's going to happen this year, but every June or July, that the the, the uh, military would put a flashpoint. They would put the Saxon with the old wings out, and then you'd the wings wouldn't fully cover the width of the bridge, so you'd have to then fill it out with with six foot shields. So you'd um. Uh, three six foot shields on the one side and fit. so two sections basically holding it out and that was our job was to go down there and um yeah some ferocious fighting then we get a lot of crossbow bolts fired at us acid chucked at us uh petrol bombs nobody can riot like the the irish they are the they are the creme de la creme of riots <laughs> i remember we was on porter down bridge and uh quite a funny story we marched down and i just said to my mate liam who i'd grown up with in falmouth and he was in my same t- he was in my team in northern Ireland. i said let's just take a chilled approach so we got down there we were there with the shields and these um uvf guys whatever you want to call them you know were behind us going telling us bobby sounds jokes and telling us and we were all like trying not to laugh. i'm a catholic myself and i was like listening to this stuff they were saying and they're going you know, your Brit, but no, we'll call those Brit bastards because that wouldn't have been there. But they were, they were getting on our cases. And um, me and Liam were like trying not to laugh. So we started smirking. They go, We've got a couple laughing here. So they're like talking to us, trying to get in with us. And we're like there with the shields, just staying composed. And I remember the, the final straw was someone had got chewing gum and put like a smiley face on his shield. <laughs> and they, they started chatting to me. I said, Guys, it's Saturday night. Wouldn't you rather be downtown just taking your missus out for a meal? Why are you down here now? writing they said oh because we love it he said we love doing this <laughs> and we so far a whole hour on that stint everything was sound and then my mate comes down um i won't say his name because he, he he comes into the story later on he became my sergeant major but we were good friends he was a sergeant and he came down with, he had two batons and he was there he was there like that conducting them and they were going you fat bastard you fat bastard and he was doing that like winding them up Next, we you know just tr- trolleys and I remember what was it step step ladders step ladders coming over and there's there's famous pictures of all this stuff here. so we're like sort of shuffling away handing over the shields to to the next and I remember then they were there was a guy like trying the Saxon door and he kept doing that and he did it for an hour he was going clink 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 and the driver's going oh for God's sake you just knock it on the head it's not going to open. He's like, kick, 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 kick. did it for an hour. And then it, went, kick, it opened. So he just opens the Samson top. <laughs> He's like that, trying to, trying to keep all the UVF from coming in. But I, let me, I don't know if it's UVF or UDA. I don't know. I don't want to get that wrong and have them in organisation left for me. But whoever was on the bridge on Porter Down, they came in through that. So he penetrated the line. And I remember they, they set fire to the Saxon and... Um, I had one of the do you remember those old radio mics with a plunger on your head you used to get a plunger and a throat mic that's all we had mate oh well I was the only one I was a new lunch jack so I was the only one who had that everyone had the Gucci little head pieces and I had the old plunger that when you used to get hot you used to slide across your eye like a <laughs> it was just... actually I think I think the, the one that clipped around your ear had just come in it just come in, but I was the only one who had that stupid throat mic. And then it used to have a pressel switch. You used to put it on your, I put it on your gat, didn't you? Used to put it on your weapon. Yeah. So I remember, go, I remember going, um, and John, my mate John, who was the, the sergeant, who was, he, he was like banging me on the head. He goes, "What are you going to do about it, man? What are you going to do about it, Webby? What are you going to do about it?" And I said, "Let's get down there and fucking kick some fucking ass. Let's kill these bastards or something like that." And all I remember is my sergeant trying to. Webby, you're on permanent set. <laughs> I put my hand on the pretzel. So this was a little early version of me. And I'd sent that over the whole brigade now. <laughs> so I got caught out on that one. Um, and that was my first experience of, and then my sergeant major pulled me to one side and said, you've got to calm down. 
because I, I did, I had, I, I know myself, I had, I had anger issues. I had issues with, I always respected the commanders on the ground that could, that could, they could do the job effectively, but they didn't lose their shit. That's why I would never get into the SAS room because I, I always lost my shit. I always had that thermostat. And then once I'd gone crazy and nuts, I'd experienced burnout. So I was pretty useless really to a, to a, to a team. I was, I, could banned. Be a I was banned from the SAS, mate. <laughs> Were you? Too hard. <laughs> Too hard. <laughs> I, was, I, I did two weeks for the selection of 2003 and I was too uh, I was too lazy I just went oh, I cannot do I remember do you know what killed me when I went to Hereford and I looked on the wall and there was a wall no more bigger than this and it was all the pass out photographs this is what broke me I looked at all the pass out photographs this was from like 10 years and there was only little little pass out photographs with like four people with, with the DS in the middle right and it was like this was like spanning 10 years. And I just looked, there's a hundred people on this course. And I went, and I looked at this, this, this is what broke. I don't know if they know that, but I was at Hereford. I think that breaks people more than anything. Looked at the one thought, what chance have I got of being on one of these pastel photographs? Creme de la creme, man. Full respect for anyone who's done that. I, honestly, I, it's not, it's not something I could ever do. Um, I have so much admiration and respect for those, those, those soldiers that get through. But, um, and, and same for, for the Royal Marines as well, and the Paras, I've been you know, a massive respect for those regiments. But going back to my story, so I come back from Northern Ireland on that tour, did the Sierra Leone tour, and I think it was by the time uh, we were supposed to go to Iraq. Um, this is an interesting story. So the build-up to Iraq, so we knew in 2002 uh, that, that, that it was building up to Iraq. We were being warned off we just passed what we call the conversion. So our regiment had gone to Germany from Edinburgh. We're based in Edinburgh, had gone to Germany and we passed our conversion. Our colonel at the time was phenomenal. Um, I won't say his name because he's not sub, but he was ex special forces. And he'd um he'd also been he'd also been SAS and also SBS. And it was very rare that someone from the SAS would, would go and command this. This is what I was told, I don't know if that's true. But he was he, he was well thought of by the SBS, and I knew an SBS guy from my local town who who actually said he he'd worked with our our CO and said he was absolutely amazing, really good to work with, and this guy's just top legend. He was in Gulf War One, and he really wanted to take us out to Iraq for Gulf War Two. Um, so we passed our conversion, and we were all set to go there, and. Um, I'd, we'd been given the anthrax jabs. So we'd been given eight inoculations of anthrax on the build-up. So in 2003, we were getting the that Christmas of 2002, going into New Year 2003, getting all the anthrax jabs. And we were just set to go. We were like, brilliant, this is amazing. And then our, our colonel brought us all on the, on the parade trail. I'll never forget it. And he, got, he goes, right, guys, I've got some really bad news. He goes, we're, we're not going to... We're not going to Iraq, we're not going to be going. Uh, they're going to be sending the um, Black Watch, and apparently Black Watch have failed their armoured conversion. And we, I just remember feeling sick in my stomach. All your life, you prepare for it, and, and to be honest, you know, I joined the army because I wanted to kill someone. That's one of the reasons. I know it sounds really cold blooded, but that was one of the reasons I, you know, I wanted to go to war. I wanted to kill someone. I wanted to shoot. I wanted to fight for my country and I wanted to do, you know, I wanted to do my service and suddenly get that feeling that you're not going. I remember just my stomach turning. So, but don't worry, we are going to send two companies from our regiment to go and attach to the Black Watch. No, to, to attach to the Fusiliers, it's Fusiliers and the Black Watch that we're going with. We're going to send two companies, and that's going to be A Company and D Company. And I, oh, sorry, I was in fire support company, and I just, I remember just feeling sick. And I just, um, I, I was promoted, I was the Lance Corporal, I was in mortars, and I thought, right, there might be a ticket, I might be able to get into this. With, and I remember, try, I remember trying to even get busters to a private so I could get in on this, on this act. Then what made the, it was, everyone was sick because you got half, you got these two companies walking around in desert kits. You got new lads turning up to battalion, right? <laughs> You've just been trained by at Winchester and, and then Catterick. 
and then suddenly they're getting given their deserts. And us as corporals and sergeants and all that, sit at the back and just got to watch these youngsters going off to war. And we're like, this is this is all. And especially when they're walking around, they have the old desert rat splashes on. And I just remember, going, oh, how can I get on this? How can I get on this ticket? And they said, don't worry, guys, because we're going to do firefighting in Birmingham. <laughs> so they rolled out the green goddesses. And my company, I remember, honestly, I wanted to cry. I've never ever felt so, oh, just felt sick, you know, like how can I, get, this is what we've been preparing for all these years. And we're, we're, we're doing green goddess training, you know, oh, don't go too close to the fire lad because these are 1930s vehicles and they're made of wood and, and like we're rolling out the, the, we're rolling out the flipping, and it had 1933 written on our hose. Like these hadn't been unpacked since 1933. This was in San Lago, getting these hoses out. And, our, and then we had a wicker basket to go on the end of it, which was a filter you could put into a lake so you could drain from a lake, like a wicker basket. This stuff, you had a you had like a Trumpson style crank to start up your you're not the selling green goddess. Me. Hey? You're not <laughs> selling it to me. And do you know what? Do you know what? Do you know what? Um, I said, what they said, right, don't go anywhere near the fire because you're not you're not fireproof. So, so what they did was they doused us in water. <laughs> To get doused in water. That was the way. <laughs> I was not making this shit up. Right. So we had to get doused in water. That was our protection against the flames. And then remember that we went to Birmingham. And so the night of all, like when you see the rock shock and awe and everything going out, we had to watch in a fire station. <laughs> I feel like crying. I can't watch it. And I wanted to be there so badly. And it, it wasn't happening. And I remember. I remember that colonel that I was talking about, we was in the mess and I said, sir, I said, why can't we go? He goes, do you not think I want to go? Do you not think I want to take this, this, this battalion that I've trained to war, Cook Webster? He said, he goes, you've got to deal with it. You've got to man up and deal with it. He goes, we're not going. He goes, so just deal with it. That's it. And I went, yeah. And then by him saying that to me, I said, so what was it that stopped us going? He said, I don't know if it's ever been known before, but he told me that the reason why the 1st Battalion Light Infantry didn't go um, because they were going to use the railhead from Germany. In San Lago, there's a railhead. So a railhead is, is like, you know, an access for military to get onto the rail and they're going to go all the way along the railway and get down to Turkey and come in through where the Kurds live. I can't remember where that is, but, you know, come in that, the north way of Iraq. So we're going to come in through. So because Turkey had turned around and said, no, we don't want anything to do with the, the Iraq war, because Turkey said no, they couldn't use the railhead, they couldn't come through that country. Does that make sense? Yes, mate, it does. I'm just so they're going, going to have to they were going to have to go through a sea a sea invasion. So so because Turkey said no, that's why our battalion couldn't go. <laughs> so I was really angry with Turkey. That was it. That's it. So the CEO said to me, don't blame, don't blame me blame the turkey because it's not my fault that we're not going or something like that and um, um so yeah so we went firefighting and we never even got to do that they didn't the the police the fire brigade didn't go on strike in the end so we didn't even get to put a fire out so it was just like <laughs> it was just it was a so I, I we come back to battalion and everyone was like you know when people talk about going to like Falklands after the Falklands or they call picking brass picking up brass don't they? So that's what we got told. Hey guys, there's an there's a there's an opportunity where when we go back to battalion, when the lads come back from the summer of fighting, you know, um, Octelic one, we might be going out to pick up their brass. <laughs> so, we were, so we were we were like that when we got back. I remember getting blueies. Remember blueies, the letters that you could send for free in the military. Yeah, do we the need to? Ex ex in the Marines, we call it picking up the cylinders. So. <laughs> It, for for friends listening, it, it's it's the cartridge casings. I, I yeah. know many of you know that or got that, but for those that are going, what what brass? <laughs> yeah, well, I, I remember getting blueies through these letters come through, and my mate was going, <laughs> "Yeah, having lots of fun, killing people, doing." And, and I was just kind of reading it, going, "I remember, I felt like crying, like because I was sort of, how, this is going to change our regiment forever. These people have done it, and we haven't." So no one's allowed to talk about it in the corporal's mess. No one's allowed to talk about it in the NAFI. No one's allowed to talk about this full stop. We don't want to hear your war stories. <laughs> so 
So we get back to the battalion, they all come back, they're just cutting around in the desert still, like, you know, we've just been, we've just been to war. And like, so you've got like corporals that have just, tra that are trained recruits at, at Catterick, right? In conventional war fighting. And then they're coming back. And then the, the crow that they taught, the, the sprogs, the joes, whatever you want to call it, that have come back from war going, they have then got to do GPMG drills and that. And they go, well, now when you've done it for real, when you've done it for real, <laughs> we constantly, so there's this whole disparity in our battalion. And it really ruined our battalion. I remember it just being like, we don't want to hear about it. And then there was this whole opportunity that we're going back out. So that was a double blow for the ones that had just come back. They only had like two months or something to literally resettle. And then they're going back out to do Optelic free. So there was no real downtime for them, bless them. But hey, we got to have our war now. Or you've had yours. <laughs> so, so we're getting pre-deployment training. And a lot of it's, we're just going off what we learned from Northern Ireland and Sierra Leone. There's, there's no rules of engagement. Obviously, there's no UN backing still for this war. Um, there's no rules of engagement. There's we're still going off. We're going to go off the rules of engagement of the yellow card when they don't speak any English. We're going off. If you remember the old um, powers of arrest was the old green card, I think the pink green card from Northern Ireland, where you could these little cards were like up infantry's documentation on how to um, how to stop and search people. We had little phrase books with, but the. The information that was leaking through, we had to pick the brains of the guys that had already been out there. But they've been fighting conventional war. So now we're moving into policing and, you know, hearts and minds and what we've been doing in Northern Ireland for the last 10 years. Uh, Mine, keep talking. I've got to go and wire a plug. Yeah, yeah, sure. So, so we are... Um, so we're, so we're deploying to Northern Ireland, uh, sorry, we're deploying to Iraq. Um, I remember uh, there was still issues with a lot of kit and equipment. We were going to use the 432s, which we've been trained in. Um, and the 432s that we were using had mortars mounted in the back of them, which had been used for, for a long time. I think the 432 itself, which then became the Bulldog, had been used since the 30s or the um, in, in um, Germany. The um, rifle companies, they would be using the Warriors and we would go out and we would uh, do a two-day, uh, two a two-week package in Basra. I remember the flight out to, to, to Iraq was with Argentine Air Airways. We got, we got to Basra and the first thing I noticed when I come off that plane is that smell that I remember from going to Jordan, um, that smell of human feces, the heat, and I, just just um, lack of you know because there is no sewage out there. There's no sewage treatment out there. So there's that that smell of that sweet smell, that smell of pungent shit and you know, heat and. I've never ever got on with it, you know, never really, I can never really, and, and dust, the dust, so you, you know, it, it, that, that, that would just bung you up. And then you, you sort of, we get off the, we get off the plane and we're given the first, this is the first, if you read my book, Soldier of Consequences, um, Soldier of Consequence, I've got my name of the book wrong. So Soldier of Consequence, I talk about it, that the, the biggest screw up of, of the, the tour which I saw, which was could have been cataclysmic if it was if it was identified by a terrorist organization or an insurgent organization out uh, there, was the fact that we get off the vehicle, we're given we're given the old Aniba vest, what they called the body armor, and we were lucky if you had, some people had one plate, some people had no pl had no plates. The old they get like a Kevlar plate, which is the stop a bullet going through your heart because the actual vest people think that's bulletproof no that just holds your organs in if you get blown up <laughs> holds your core together um but the plate down the middle does stop rounds because I've, I've had friends that have been shot and in, in, and it does does actually work the kevlar it's amazing stuff some people have one plate some people are, i had none uh, getting given a horrible have a box, the old white have a box with something local that's been made locally that would have some strange meat in it. Um, and a bottle of screech or pop, like orange juice to be warm. 
a mouldy apple, a pack of local crisps with some dodgy flavouring on it, and just oh, and then some melted chocolate bar. Um, getting that, and then sat down, feeling vulnerable. You haven't got your weapon, um, and then we all just piled onto these buses, and I was just like, oh my god, I can't believe this. And outside, what turned up was basically two military police Land Rovers. You know what they're like, you know, with their chef's webbing, you know, pouches hanging down, all undone. Like, just all they would have. <laughs> the 9 mil pistol each. Like, 9 mil pistol. Like, not even looking, not even covering their arcs. They're just kind about. So you've got a whole battalion. So you're looking at 500 people getting onto wagons with no weapons, right? And they all they said for us to do was close the curtains. So these little, what they call jundi trucks like you know like so we're closing the curtains <laughs> oh, God. this is this is suicide so we're all on the the whole battalion 500 people getting on these shitty little rickety buses right and then two land rovers for escorts one either side so this whole convoy whole brigade right whole sorry not brigade battalion moving with these two i mean what these these military police were going to do they'd be they'd be useless so move 500 body of men to um was it called in Shiba? We called it Shy Beefer because everyone <laughs> probably get in trouble for that. But that's what the, that's what everyone used to label it. It's the logistics base is um Shy Beefer log base. So we moved to Shiba log, base. but we get lost. So we're two hours. Now we're in the thick of bus <laughs> Right? We're going, what's going on? So these military police guys have got lost, right? And we're like opening the curtains, looking out, and never, honestly. All you needed was about 10 RPGs and that's 500 men taken out. What a score if they got it, you know? Unbelievable, isn't it? You can't fathom it. How stupid. Who organised that? Whoever organised that should be... He's probably he's probably got... I bet he got... I bet he would... The person who organised that sat there now with one of those CBEs or something now. <laughs> anyway... So then we do like a we do a two week package. Then we start getting these guys turning up, right? Honestly, check that you are not going to pay this story, right? <laughs> like, this guy turns up, right? And um, I can give his nickname because it's not his real name. I, I, I can't remember what his real name was, but he was a really short dude, right? And he goes, and everyone just started laughing. So what's going on? He goes, this guy's he joined the TA two weeks ago. <laughs> He's never even been to a meeting, and they've sent him straight out to the. <laughs> He's a civvy taken from Civvy Street and plonked out of us. We go, you are joking. He said, no. He said, I've never fired a weapon, never seen a weapon. Never. Like, and he's the minimi gunner. He was assigned as a mini mini gunner. So we're there taking him through for right? <laughs> an hour course on how to fire an SA80. Right. We had the same thing when we, when we left Belfast and we, yeah. we went from <laughs> uh, whatever the name of the. We, had, we went from Girdwood Park to whatever the bar Is it. Uh, Hollywood barracks or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, it doesn't matter. And on this real vulnerable trip, where they just chucked us in the back of a four-tonner. <coughs> no, it was a furniture van, right? Right. As if like the IRA didn't suss that they were using this <laughs> furniture van to move a whole unit of, 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 of troops around the province. And um, in hops this army chef that's just going to the airport, right? Yeah. And the um, the driver of this furniture van runs around the back with an SA-80 in his hand and a, and a, a loaded magazine. As right, follows someone take this, and he just shoves it at the chef, <laughs> and the chef goes, "Ooh, I've never fired one of these before." <laughs> <laughs> and still to this day, I don't know why I didn't just go fucking give me that. <laughs> yeah, I know, mate. It, it, the, the, the thing is, by the time we got to Iraq, every, the, the, it was so preposterous, the stupidity, the stuff. I mean, like the first, because the first wave, they went out on Octelic 1, they went out in green kit because, and the reason why they went out in green kit was because the government didn't want to put an order in for like, I don't know, 100,000 deserts because that would have that would have triggered the media and they would have found out in 2002 we were, we were already set to go. Does that make sense? Hmm. So that was, that was a, the, so 
that's no excuse for that. That's, we should have had those deserts, end of, you know, and not the polyester deserts, the old good quality, you know, the jungle stuff, the first jungle issue that, because when I was in Sierra Leone, we got the polyester 95 kit, it, was just, it just made you sweat and you got loads of rashes under you. But the old desert stuff they used to use in Belize from the 80s, and all that, that stuff was really sought after. When we was in Sierra Leone, we wanted to get that, those old, because it was made of cotton and it, it was breathable. And you could wear it for yeah. three days. You could wear it for three days and it's not going to cause you... If you if you took the jungle hat, yeah, which looks like the thing, you know, girls wear on the beach, uh, and if you cut the band off it around the around the rim, yeah, yeah, then you use that as your 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 neck strap. Well, I don't even know the name of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it also makes your hat a little bit cooler because it it, sh- yeah. it shrinks. Our recce platoon always used to cut their hats right that there. But then they end up with burning their faces, the daft bastards, because they we were in mortars, we had them as big as they could be. We were like sombreros. Because <laughs> you, you probably had it with, with mortars, was always all that, like, because I was in mortar platoon, that was all the bad lads. <laughs> all the guys that went to sign off went to mortars because it was a lot more relaxed, a lot more chill. And a lot of the fatties were in mortars as well. So. Well, yeah, in, in, in the core, <laughs> in the core, it's always mad mental mortars. <laughs> <laughs> All the nutters going water. So, so, um, so where are we? We've got to Iraq. We're, we're there. Um, right, so we've got this guy. Anyway, he goes for a shower, and he's got the smallest, you know what? So they start labelling him Ratscock. That's his nickname. Right, like, your now name is Ratscock. So they're all teasing him. Called so Ratscock is like. Serve him with us, got no experience, cracking lad. He was a pharmacist, far, t- like trained pharmacist, and now he's now he's out there deploying with us. And there was a few others. There was one lad, I had one of the lads, because he was in the rifle company. Because we were a senior company, we didn't have that, like I couldn't behave like I would do in a rifle company because you have some seriously hard bastards in mortars, like so you wouldn't be like dishing out the punches and, and <laughs> you, you got some stronger guy. So the rifle company is, is more fisty cuffs and more, you know, they're knocking each other out. And I heard that one of the young lads, the, the TA, not like Ratscock, but he, he'd, he'd fell asleep on stag because he'd never been shown. He's never been taught. So he fell asleep on stag and one of the lads broke his jaw. And I thought that was wrong because at the end of the day, they don't know. If they don't know, they don't know. You can't beat someone up because they don't. That that for me was wrong to do that to him, bless him. You know, the guy's he's a civilian who's been taken out. I mean, that wouldn't probably have happened in the first world war. They at least they'd have got six weeks training before they went out to the front line. So they got this guy completely preposterous. So the tour is relatively calm, right? In fact, it got so calm out there, nothing was happening. We started doing in-camp training. So I was like set to go on Brecon because I wanted to go and train recruits at ATL Winchester. So I'm starting to do beat-up training for Brecon to go and get my full screw and, to, and train recruits. That's how calm it got. There was one incident where I came around, was it? There was one instance where my friends, a uh, couple of my platoon, had shot up some, some Iraqis, and this was the closest i come to shooting my weapon on the first part of the tour. We get the, we comes over the, comes over the intercom that we've um, got... Uh, six six Iraqi dead or something like that and this was not far from Danny Boy I think so we drive down there and the first time I've seen dead bodies like so it's first time I've seen dead bodies that we've shot so I'm like right guys let's get amongst it so the, the, our commander's on the ground and he said right court website I want you to go down this body and just patrol up there and I'm thinking oh, it's because we saw a couple of um uh, shooters running down that way so I think oh, I might get to shoot someone in and they get that nervous sort of buzz and I'm moving down this body uh, me and Jono who's a sergeant uh, and then I come across my sergeant major and it was the first time I'd, I'd seen my sergeant major flustered he was because he just shot someone he's like but no we, we just shot someone like you know and this this you just seen like the different reactions in people once coming under contact so you're seeing like sergeant major crack really fit guy lovely sergeant major and he was like Flipping out, I've just done it, I've done it, you know, I've done, I've, like, and it's it's almost like, the only way I can describe it, people call it like breaking your cherry, you know, it's like, so I'm like, flipping out, there might be more down there, there might be more down there, I've carried on down the body, there's no one there, come back, and then we've got to get these dead bodies back into, into the town, so what do we do, what's the score now, you've shot people, right, and then you're going to take them to their local village, they're not going to be happy about this, are they? 
So then we drive in, we drive into the village, and then the cut the the our commander, um, uh, Major Fawkes, he he said, um, he was cool as a cucumber, right? Cool. Well, so we're just going to take these dead bodies into the Red Cross. We're going to let, and he's just so calm, right? Like, the way he talk, the way he talk was like like there was nothing going, like this was a normal deal, and then we're gonna we're gonna drive out of there, right? And I remember Assad, our our interpreter, and. If there's any heroes that come out of my stories, it's, it's the people like Assad, who was an interpreter, who, who was assigned to us, who went, Webby, Webby, grenade. And he, he spotted this kid with a grenade. He was about to toss it onto our vehicle. And I remember just lightning, cocking my weapon. Weapons were already cocked, but it was, I just, I tried to make, like, I went, I, like, I clicked, so, to just, just to create some noise, because it's already cocked. So I'm like, <laughs> You fucking fuck, you throw that in here and you're fucking dead, son. This kid must have been about, I don't know, nine or ten. And he's there with a great, and this is what you're faced against. And I'm looking at him, he's got the pin, he's got the, the and, he, and he's literally about to pull it. And I went, you do that and you're fucking dead. Do you understand, you little prick? Anyway, he's looking at me like that. And he knew I meant this. I will put bullets for your heart. You put that in our van like that. And he, he, he walked down the road. He carried on down the road and he went round a, a wall. And then I was concerned it was going to come over this wall. So I then sent that message to boss. Come on, look, boss. There's a guy that he's going to throw a grenade. His kid's going to throw a grenade at us. And this is what we're constantly coming under. It's kids, the kids that with grenades. And the thing is, a kid can kill you just the same as, a, as, a, as a, an adult, you know. And how many people have been, how many British soldiers have been killed out there by children, you know. And this is what, in our civilian world, we don't understand that. We see kids on the street here, playing, but you go to the province in Northern Ireland, those kids, have, those kids can be trained killers. They could have killed a couple of soldiers. They can push a, a flipping fridge off a bridge on top of a snatch vehicle. They can, they, they can do, they can, it's hard to explain to people that have never been to a combat zone how children can be suddenly your, your nemesis. Let, they can be. Let, let, let's not forget because they they're under the control of adults and and also absolutely and they don't have any and, conscious part of their brain. They don't see any fear. They, and they, also, they see it as a game. let's not forget they form the vast majority of casualties as well. The the not innocent, massively the innocent not, people are the most the most to die right. But you, you've got to survive. And my, my, my aim as a corporal is to bring my team back alive. That's it. So, so it, it, if a woman, a child, a man, anyone that's going to get, that, that could possibly be in my team not coming back, alive, then they, they're gonna, they are going to lose their life. If they're going to harm us in any way, they're going to lose their life. Again, it's that protection of yourself and the team. Um. So, so that was it. And then there was an incident two days later, we went in early morning village and the same sergeant major who'd shot that person up for uh, Craig Bernie came around the corner. He was stood there and we'd gone into this village early in the morning, done a raid. And I remember seeing this guy with an AK-47 just coming around the back of the, uh, and he was about to gun down the Colonel, uh, the Colonel, the, the, the OC, Major Fawkes and Craig with Bernie, sergeant major. They were stood there talking and I'm, and I'm, I wasn't made ready at this point, so cocking my weapon was a great. It was a great way to cock your weapon because they, when they hear that bullet slide in, it makes that. It's it's almost like, right, you fire that and you're dead. End of. This is no. There's, there's no conversation here. And I, I challenged um, me and Brownie challenged this guy, and I remember some age went thanks for Webster. Thanks for watching my back there because we were, we we'd seen it, seen this guy coming in. So they were the only two sort of incidents that really happened then. And then it sort of just calmed right down. Coming up to Christmas winter period for 2003, going into 2004, calmed right down. And I remember doing my uh, uh, pre uh, Bracken training. So I was doing like lessons, uh, weapon handling lessons, and just skill at arm stuff, really, and a bit of tactics and doing a bit of fitness, being at ICFT, the, the two mile up with um, in your webbing, rifle, helmet, as fast as you can do it. I mean, you've got like 15 minutes to do it so we were running that around camp and same with the guys that were going on for the sergeant at Brecon so all of that was was happening so I was going to get my Christmas leave went back for Christmas as soon as I get back for Christmas leave on the TV Alamara seeing my my platoon fighting holding up like riots and, and I was like what what am I doing here so so Christmas uh, January time I'm on 
I'm in Wales watching it on the TV, watching my mates getting stuff in, in, in Iraq. And I'm thinking, right, what's the strategic way out of here now? Right, I've got three more weeks of this um, phase where I've got basically, I needed my skill at arms because I want to train recruits. That was my aim was to become, so I've got three more weeks here. And then I've got to do another six weeks battle. The, they call it um, the battle phase of Brecon. And I thought, well, I can go up to Iraq now. I can finish my, my skill at arms, right? And then I go on to the, what they call the tactics phase. So you're doing basically conventional warfare. But why do I want to be doing tactics in Wales when I could be out in Iraq doing it for real? So what I did was I, I, I did my, I finished my skill at arms phase, right? And then I pulled a back injury, right? I remember doing the, the build-up training for tactics. So I pulled a back injury. I said, oh, my back's gone. Went into the med center because I'd had back injuries before. They call it the Brecon Sniper. <laughs> so I used to get it off. I used it to get off um, when I was on um, selection. I, I, I was like, this is too hard for me. I'm getting off it. So I, I did the Brecon Sniper, come off uh, SAS selection 2003. And then 2004, I, I was back in Brecon again to do the bloody, um, what do you call it? Ma Martin, it, it sounds like we're skipping a bit here. You... No, because what I'm going to do, I'm putting, I'm putting everything is how did I get back out to Iraq? Because I was sent back to England to do, all, so I was, I wasn't even, when I got done for what I was done for in Iraq, I wasn't even supposed to be out there. So what I did was I was like, I, I faked a back injury on Brecon, right? Done my tactics. So yeah, I got that in the book. Mate, what I'm trying to get to is, did you say you are on SAS selection? I was on SES selection in 2003. That was before, um, I was, was it 2003 or 2002? It might have been 2000, and, it was 2003, I think. I can't, I can't remember, but I was on SES selection. I managed to get on the, 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 the two week that you do at Hereford and I got onto the, the full selection. Um, that's it, because when all the firefighting stuff, so that, that SES selection was about when all the firefighting nonsense was going on. So everyone was at war and SES selection was still going on in Brecon. So I did it, yeah, 2003, I did my, my, my SES selection. So it was a full on year. I was here, there, everywhere. You know? So, but I can't, I can't, listen, I don't make any problems about it. I found SES selection too hard. I couldn't, it wasn't for me, right? And then when I did the SSBC nonsense, what they call it, uh, juniors i did the tactics got that tick in the book and i'd already been promoted to corporal thought well why do i need to do tactics for when i can go back out to iraq now and do some real fighting so i rung up i rung up germany and i spoke to the movements clerk you have a movements clerk in your battalion which allows you to if you're going to go back to england you have to go in with a movements clerk and they book you the flight and you're going on a course and so i rung up the movements clerk and i just said oh look i've uh, I've, I've been um I've, I've been discharged from uh, Brecon. Major Fawkes has requested me to be back in. <laughs> so I used my boss they, has requested me to be back out in Iraq. So she said, don't worry, we've booked you on the next flight from Hanover to Basra uh, in two weeks' time. I went, that's awesome. So I drive back to Germany, have a week off. Um, my mate is on rear party. So he, he, he drives me to, I've got no weapon. Just got my kit to go back to Iraq. Um, and when I was in Iraq, I bought one of those Garmin GPSs. So when I was in Iraq in 2003, what I did was I, every time I, we was, I would hit a waypoint, I don't know if you remember using the old GPSs, cracking little bits of kit. And I used to put a waypoint. So if you were driving up, a, like it was at the notorious Route 6, when I was coming from um, Alamara to Basra, just to explain geographically. So in, in Iraq, you imagine... You've got Basra, which is the start point of Iraq, and then you've got Alamara, which is along the notorious Route 6. Then you've got um, Baghdad, which is further on. The deeper you go into Iraq is obviously the capital of Iraq. So you imagine Basra and, and I think they're probably about 300, I don't know, 300 miles apart. And then halfway in between that, you've got Camp Uba, Alamara, which is where we were based. So we were between Basra and, and Baghdad. That's That was... That was the area that we were sort of, my regiment were deployed to. So I fly back to Iraq. Um, and this time what I noticed was that we got a military flight back. So we go to some unknown airport. I don't know what this airport was, but it was some big American airport. And then you get on this military plane 
And then this military um, hurt comes in on a real steep descent. I've never experienced it before, but it was on a really steep descent. They said, right, we're coming into it. And I remember the door gun and then blowing chaff out. And I remember it feeling very different from when I left in 2003. So the, this felt more, def, there was definitely a def, different tension. I thought, let's have this. This is going to be awesome. Get into, um, and then I, I'm, I remember seeing Nell McAndrew. She was on a BFBS tour or whatever, you know, when they get like a famous person out there. And she had to use a portal. It was disgusting. <laughs> it's all those shit of porno mags in it. <laughs> I went, I went, apologies for the, um, that was in Basra Airport. And then I spoke to someone down and I said, look, how can I get to Abu Naji? How can I get to uh, Alamara? And our camp was called Abu Naji. How can I get there? And they went, there's some RLC guys that are driving up that road, uh, driving up Route 6. You might be able to tag along with them. So I went up to these RLC guys and I said, hi guys, can I get a, a lift with you up to Abu Naji? He went, yeah, sure. So I spoke to the driver, very similar to the, you know, I said, where's your weapon, mate? He went, oh, in the back. So I'm like, what? So I, I, I said, do you mind if I take this? Like, so I took his weapon and it was caked, it absolutely caked in shit, caked in dust. Typical RLC guy. <laughs> no offense to him not there, but this was this was not a good this was not a good look. So I take his weapon apart, strip it down, clean it, get it all oiled up, nice looking at, get his took his took his magazine apart. And what I always used to do, I always put 20 rounds in because uh, the special forces guy taught me that. I said, I always have you. You have 20 rounds in your first magazine because the spring, do you think you've got 30 rounds? We used to carry, what, 30 rounds in a magazine for a whole tour of Northern Ireland, not fire your weapon once because if you didn't have a contact, you know, and you always used to take your, your bullets out to let your spring, get the spring this back, didn't you? And then oil the spring. So I completely took the magazine apart, got my first 20 rounds in there, ready to go, caught my weapon, so a bullet in the chamber, GPS on, GPS on, I thought, right, if we get contacted, if this RLC guy don't give a shit about it, this is my weapon now. And I'm going to, and then what I do is I'll do my little Bravo 20 to get back to Abu Naji where all my mates are. Right. So <laughs> this is my little fantasy bit in my head. Hopefully we'll get a contact on the way up there. So we drive up there, turn up to Abu Naji, and everyone's just like, mate, you've missed a party. I don't know if you've ever seen Tackleberry from Police Academy. Do you remember? And he always used to miss the riot and he's just, come on. It's like, Oh, I can't believe I've missed it again. And they went, you've just missed the Battle of Kalatsali. And I was like, what was Kalatsali? He goes, he goes, you're not heard. And they go, well, um, if you look it up, there's a, there's a book called Condor Blues, um, the Battle of Kalatsali or Kalatsali. Uh, and I've been there before, but only on patrols. And he said, what happened was they drove in, uh, three Land Rovers drove in which was my Sergeant Major, uh, the colourful Sergeant Major, which is mentioned in the book. It's called the colourful Sergeant Major. It was my sergeant from, I won't mention his name because he wouldn't appreciate it. So they drive into Kalatsali. So as soon as, so I turn up and John goes, you've missed it, mate. He, so John sits me down. He's the Sergeant Major. He goes, you've missed it, mate. He, goes, he starts explaining to me what happened. He goes, we can't even go out, me and the boss, because we've got like 50 fatwas on our head and all this shit, right? He said... He said, we drove into Kalatsali. He said, uh, me and uh, another guy called Dave. He said, we get out with the boss and we started interviewing the police. And we said, right, we want to inspect the police. Their, their job was to, to keep an eye on the police and what the police were doing. We want to look in that room. And the police officer said, no, you're not going in that room. So John said, I'm going in that fucking room. So they kicked the door in and they find like literally a cache of like, like, I don't know, a thousand RPGs, all of this stuff, like weapons, there were AK 47s, and he's like, What's all this shit? They pulled a weapon on our ROC. So John double taps this guy, kills him. Don't quote me on all of this because some of this I'm, I'm vaguely remembering. And then Dave shoots another copper because he pulls a weapon on him. And then two coppers start firing them from the police station. So they ran into the police station and started shooting up the roof. They started dropping grenades out. The way they were telling the story, it just sounded like from a film. I was like, wow. Oh, my God. I just couldn't take it anymore. I was just like, this is amazing. And then two RPGs came in and blew up the Land Rovers. Right? So the Land Rovers, that the, the, the military guys that come in on, have been blown up. These guys are hiding down the wall. And there's a famous picture on the book Condor Blues. If you see the, the, the book Condor Blues, there's a picture where they're all hiding. And you'll see Major Fawkes because he's got a little hat, a little tiny... Um, desert out on and everyone else has got their helmets on they're lying down 
So then they all ran into the police station and Harry got shot in the ass. Um, <laughs> Trent Martin, big fat Trent, picked up Harry and ran with him. And he's like, I hope you're not dead, Harry. Harry's like, oh, no. they, so they rescued each other. And, was, and then they was all in the building and the whole of the town of Quiet Salise starts kicking off and starts firing at them. Then another call sign came in. They had, they had our... They had our female pay clerk trapped in because she used to do a bit of interpreting. I can't remember what her name was. Ginger girl, really nice girl. She was trapped in the building with a blesser. She had the gun set. So John, who was the the, the star major, right? He started deep. The other lads told me John was just absolutely hilarious. They said he was he was he was doing karate kicks. Like as the bullets were coming in, he was doing karate kicks. Got ha ha. Right, lads, this is what we joined up for. Take your positions at the window. He said, it goes, uh, target's wolf full, in it? And he just started detailing out, you know, giving them their arcs. And then he started chucking out AK-47s, RPGs, and started going, right, let's use these weapons against them. So they started using the um, the, the stuff that was, in, that was in that PlayStation. Major Forks is on the blower asking for support. And... Um, then they're getting phone calls from from the from the from the people of Kalatsale saying, "If you do not hand yourself over, you'll be killed." Like the the, the military police, because the military police were killed in two thousand and three. At um, what was that? Is it Masayaka? I think it was, no, so I can't remember what it was called now. But another village up the road, the military police were killed because they went into the building. Yeah, was it Naz 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 something, or am I? Do you want to just six, do you want to just explain um, so people six, get... six military police six military police were, were were executed they 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 went in to investigate some paras that had been in the contact they went in this is what I was told that when I was that they went in they left their vehicles outside um, which had their rifles on in the rifle racks they didn't have the rifles on they only had their nine mil pistol on a couple of nine mil pistols. Uh, the interpreter said, look, they're going to kill you. The interpreter, because the interpreter told us this stuff out there, the interpreter jumped out the back window of, of the police station and made his way to Route 6, and the and the military police then handed themselves in, where they then were, were tortured for two hours. There's there's a lot, I think there's a the film with Tim Roth in it, where he played the father, because one of the fathers was that Reg Keys, Reg Keys. Because he did a big, remember he he took on Tony Blair and there's huge amount. He he found out that his son was tortured through through opening the coffin. So there's a lot of stuff on that. But the, those those guys were um, unfortunately we learn from their their mistakes. So you can't hand yourself into these people. They, they will butcher you. They will chop you. They will chop your privates off. They'll skin you alive. They'll set fire to you. They'll do things to you that you can't imagine. Hello, still there? Yes, mate. It was Major Al Kabir. Is it? Is that? Does that ring a bell? Yeah, Al Majub Al Kabir. Al Majub Al Kabir. Yeah, <laughs> Majub Al Kabir. Yeah, oh, something like that. Sorry, mate. I've lost my thing. I've no one sec. Keep, keep yeah. talking. So you have Al Majub Al Kabir. Then you've got. Um, so then you've got Kalatsali, which is the next big incident where a military cross was run. It was won by a guy from the PWRR. Now that's not to take anything away from him. But he, he was a sergeant who was in the area. He was at um, Camp Condor and they were doing like a pre-handover because we were getting ready. We were weeks away from handing over to the PWRR, which was... Um, so this this sergeant came in to back up um, our, our officers, uh, officers um, ROC, uh, Major Forks, his, his call sign. So they had some extra troops to boost them up, and he came in. And he got his, he got his, I think it's a part part of his hand shot off, and he carried on firing from the window. So he got he won the military cross for that. Um, I wasn't there, so I'm only going off the stories what the guys told me. But but what they were telling me, they were saying it's phenomenal. And one of the funny incidents was was the Ross Strip who's from St Just. He said to me, he goes, Martin, he's honestly John Wayne was so funny. Because he was making so many jokes and having so much fun. He said, we didn't feel in danger. So we were just enjoying it. He said, even though it was really scary, we just enjoyed it. And I knew John was like that from working in Northern Ireland. He just he, he just had this sense of humour and this sense of feeling. When you're working with these commanders, that 
because they're having such fun, you don't feel in any way for you think, well, if they're feeling like that, then we should, it just spreads this, this feeling of joy when you're in the combat. And the guys were like, honestly, just cracking jokes. Next thing you know, there's a phone call and it's the, the, the Iraqis and, and they get the interpreter and the interpreter says, you know, if you don't hand yourself over, you'll be killed like the men at uh, Al Kabir. So John Wake goes, right, we've got our demands. And they said, so I want you to interpret this to, to the Iraqis. And they said, demands? He said, yeah, we want demands, right? So John said, I want, I want 12 pepperoni pizzas and some garlic bread cycles. <laughs> Puts his order in. And he goes, make sure you interpret it. So he said, oh, we want six, 12 pepperoni pizzas. <laughs> And then side on the guy that bread. And um, yeah, they it, it 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 went on all night. And those that were involved in it, uh, that fi- that should be made into a film. If I that's another little film. I'm like, I wasn't there, but flipping out, it was. So I thought, well, if they've had this big battle here, there might be some battles left, you know, coming up. And boy, was it was it going to happen? Can't they always? It's almost like the Iraqis gave you a couple of weeks in between each contact it, it probably didn't happen later for the PWR because they had a right shit sandwich when they got there so things had, things had uh, calmed down to the point where we were having a curry night that was it because it was coming to the end of the tour we'd actually handed in our modics the modics to explain our your night vision goggles you know PMGs and anything Gucci any Gucci kit that was sort of like we you know to enhance all our riot shields given in the riot kit Plastic visors, visors around the head, around that used to go around the front of your helmets. Um, so we're giving all that kit, giving our tracer rounds back. So we're giving the tracer rounds back. So we didn't have a big tracer. Um, just to be aware, when I was out in Iraq, I bought an extra 150. No, I bought an extra two, 300 bullets off a off a Scottish soldier. So I, I was carrying illegal ammunition basically when i was out there loads of people was, we was buying as many rounds because you only issued 150 bullets which is insane Who, who's been paintballing you've, you and you've bought a thousand thousand paintballs to go paintballing but you're going out to iraq and you've got 150 bullets unbelievable isn't it that's yeah. peacetime operation so we're going out with 150 bullets no grenades so i've got extra 300 rounds extra magazines that i've all bought i nicked a sidearm from from a taxi so I had an extra, I had a nine mil pistol um, that I nicked. I don't care. I'm quite happy to say it. At the end of the day, Tony Blair, you send me out to the wall with none of the equipment. I'm going to nick still. I'm going to take whatever I need to go and survive that tour. That really pisses me off when I think they sent us out there with the wrong kit. They're not, they're not really and sending you to war though, mate, are they? I, 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 know no, it, no. I know it's combat. They're sending you there as subterfuge while they put their puppets in place. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So, so we, we, so we're, so we're, we're assembling. We're doing whatever we can to survive the six months of hell that they've, 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 they've sent us out to deal with. So everything, everything calms down to the point where we've got a curry night and we're allowed a can each, right? So we go to the younger lads, right? You give us your cans. So we've got three cans, and you know when you're drunk for like God knows how long, you know, for a couple of months, you only got to drink two cans and you're feeling drunk. So we're all sat there having a can. And Harry's telling us about he got shot in the ass at Kalatsa Lee and all this lot. And he's telling, I was just like sitting there going, tell me more, tell me more. I was just was absorbing their war stories. And then next thing you know, <laughs> Russian rockets coming into the into the camp, hitting our hitting our um football pitch. Um, and then it was like, right, Major Forks gets we all get kitted up. We've all had like a, about a beer each, right? We've all um got all our right kit on. We all assemble and um, we drive straight into Abenaji. Uh, not into Abenaji. Uh, you've got, if I can explain. So geographically, you've got Basra, you've got Alamara, you've got Baghdad. We're in Alamara. That's that sort of um, our, our tactical area of interest that we are sort of um, operating in. Uh, in Alamara, you've got the football stadium. You've got, uh, these are the key points of interest. You've got the football stadium where we've got people from a company there. So you've got a rifle company, you've got a platoon from rifle company there with warriors, the big armed um, APCs, because they are classed as APCs, aren't they? Not classed as tanks. We've got them, we've got mortars mounted on the back of 432s. And what we've done, we've assembled them on the football pitch, which is what just been attacked. Interestingly enough, our pot washers, 
who were local people, what we found out later on were GPSing. <laughs> so they were, they were giving information to, they were GPSing on, on to get that mortar fire as close as they could to, to the troops tents because the, the, the football pitch was right next to the troops tents. So our pan bashers, the people that were employed to wash all our dishes were, um, were acting as uh, mortar fire controllers <laughs> for Russian rockets that were coming in. So we've got um, Simic House. Simic House is right in the dead centre of where the Tigris and Euphrates River meets. And you can look up at it's literally where the Tigris and Euphrates meet. And if you watch my film, Diary of Disgrace, I get a goose pimple without talking about it, was Harry, who was in my film, who was my old school teacher, who's passed away now. But he said that the, the, where the Tigris and the Euphrates meets is the cradle of civilization. Which, which really sends goosebumps down me when I think about what went on there. So you've got Simic House and you've got the Pink Palace, the, um, the Pink Palace, which was the Pink Palace. And it was one of Saddam's palaces. And um, one of our jobs was to keep Simic House and the Pink Palace and the stadium as um, Brit, you know, British, um, under our British rule, if you like whatever we were because our main mission was to to bring uh infrastructure to bring jobs to bring currency us dollars and to yeah to get all that up and all we really basically bought them was yellow wind up radios that didn't work very well so they could listen to bfbs and listen to our <laughs> oh god so it's all shit's kicking off we've got a company which is about what 100 blokes 100 blokes based at um, Simic House. Now, they're younger guys, right? Mortars, we've got the more senior guys, the more senior guys. We, we're, hit, we're really top-heavy with full screws, corporals, lance corporals, sergeants, colour sergeants. We're top. It, even our platoon, we didn't have an officer. We had a colour sergeant because we've got that many. Uh, mortars works slightly different than the normal platoons. So we, we leave a platoon to manage to, to, to run a, a, a mortar line on the football pitch. And we, we've got a platoon to give support into it. And I wanted to get some action. So I wanted to get into Simic House because that's where I earned all the action. I actually been to Simic House for the whole tour. So we, we drive in convoy, we get into the town and this is the first night of disruption. There's, a, there's some sporadic gunfire everywhere, but nothing to, but we get told that tomorrow on our in brief tomorrow, uh, there will be there'll be over like three thousand protesters. So we turn up the next day, um, get there early, and uh, get the right kit on, and we literally get what we do. We don't put the right kit on first because our our orders were by Major Fox was not to preempt them. They are to. I've got all this on video. He, he gave us all. He says right, if they want to fight, we'll fight them. But if they want to walk away and leave it, then we'll just let them fight each other. You know, we'll just. We'll just go out there, real relaxed. So we we went out there with soft posture, which was the floppy hats. Um, riot kit was all like hidden behind the wall, no sticks, and we just sat along the wall side. Then they started throwing the stones, the grenades started coming in. So we set up the baseline, and that's what you see on Diary of Disgrace Soldier. You see some of the shields, you see the the grenades coming in, and all we did was push a baseline right up to uh, the edge of Pink Palace, right our boundary of what what we were meant to protect and defend. Shot a few people with plastic bullets, but what they failed to do was give us the the old cleaning rods for the for the for the old, which were the same standard Northern Ireland batting guns. But when you haven't got the brushes to clean them out, you know after six or seven rounds they get they get coked with carbon and they don't fire. <laughs> so they literally just come out like that, out the barrel. So in the end, it was just a deterrent for making a noise because they they were useless. We didn't have the, the barrel brushes. Plastic shields, grenades coming in. Grenades don't do anything. The plastic shields don't do anything to protect you from a grenade, um, especially the Russian grenades. And um, then that that whole day of rioting. I mean, you've done riot training, and you when you're standing up there, it's it's exhausting, isn't it? It's exhausting. Your heart's going. The, the adrenaline. You're using it constantly up. The adrenaline. Um, and when you've got no one to relieve you because everyone's out that becomes quite, quite hard. So then that night we get detailed to go onto the palace roof and 
that's my first sight of an RPG, and I just missed it on my video camera. I would love to have caught this. So, just to, to um, explain to, to everyone, before we went up to Iraq, this, you could buy these little Sony digital recorders, tiny little things that you could literally tape to your, and just press record, so I could record what was going on around me. You know, these tiny little cameras. And people say, well, why would you, why would you film war? Well, why not, you know? I bought, I bought this tiny little camera. It's not, it's not affecting me operationally, so why not? And my OC saw that I had it on, saw that a few people had them on, and didn't really think to say, right, don't turn that up. Because there was a few videos done of Northern Ireland when people were taking bigger cameras out to Northern Ireland and filming some of the stuff. So no one had really foreseen that there'd be a problem. That, but, but this was the first time, I think, that so many different phases of war were going on. There was no way of policing what we were doing. So I'm filming what's going on in war. So that night, RPG goes straight down the road. I miss it by a second. I was like, damn, this RPG flies past my face. I wanted to catch it. Hitting, it, hitting Simic House, right? So I missed that. So then I recorded a few gunfights going off around the, um, around the top of the palace. Um, and then it got so bad, I just put the camera away because it was just the amount of gunfight that was coming in. We was fighting on all corners and that's when like the most heaviest sort of gunfight I've ever sort of come across with uh, up to my soldiering career. Um, I'm at one point being pinned down in the corner of a wall on the palace roof and the gunfire was coming down. If you watch um, the PW, if you watch PWRR in Iraq on YouTube, you can see them fighting or Simic House uh, PWRR tour. There's some great footage that they shot in the daytime on on that roof of them getting some minimum rounds down and that. So I'm in the corner. Bullet fires are coming. The bullet fires coming down. And I remember literally being tucked into this wall, and the bullets were coming past and hitting them and ricocheting off. And I just thought to myself then, if someone said over the top, I. I it started to dawn on me on what they must have faced during the First World War. There's no way, when I look back, there's no way if someone said over the top would I have... The only way I fired was literally by bringing my hand over the wall, using it to rest like that, and firing, firing back. That was the only way, that was the only way I could get any sort of return gunfire back. And I was shooting... I didn't know where I was shooting, to be honest, and I found out in the morning. I'll explain that later in the story. So we've got the gunfight going out. And I remember taking so many rounds in this corner and then all I heard was, I need some backup in this corner. And this guy called under gunfire, comes right in and he goes, oh, I'm here now. So this guy gets in with me. And I said, nice. And we both got up and we started returning fire. And I looked at him and saw he was a colour son. I saw a side colour. I didn't realise he was a colour son. He said, oh, I'm any TA. Uh, I was like, and I think at that point, I never ever would disrespect the Territorial Army ever again. It was that, I think, the TA, because they boosted up our troops and the stuff that they did, the, I think they're the unsung heroes of Iraq. You know, this TA guy crawls up under gunfire, gets into the corner with me and, and manages to help me um, suppress fire. But things quiet down again. Um, and I remember posting... Uh, so just to rewind back again, there's a story... Uh, before I fired my first... Um, before the gunfight started, there's a little story I wanted to tell. It was just, I remember, I, I remember my sergeant said, right, go and post your men down there. So I got this road to look down and I said, right. I said, Matt, come here. I said, right, that's your left of art, that's your right of art. Anything coming down, anything coming down with a weapon, pointing at us, putting us in danger, take it out with a GPMG. And he hadn't named, and, and I said, have you made ready, ready your GPMG? And he went, yeah, all right, good. So I, I got down behind the wall and I started to put, take off my jumper because I wanted, so I wanted to put a fleece on because it started getting, it started getting cold. And all I remember was putting my fleece and I just got it up here to my zip. And all I remember was AK-47 fire coming over my head and picked up my weapon, got into it, and I fired 20 rounds off in where the muzzle flash was coming from in the general direction that. And then I heard clunk next to me. And this isn't to run Mac down or anything, but I remember the importance of we're not in Northern Ireland. You've got to have that. You, that, that whole of him not being ready. And the first thing I did to him was I said, I said, you did well then, Matt. I didn't shout at him. I didn't scream at him. I didn't, because, you know, 
as a commander, I remember having that done to myself. You made a fuck up a mistake. The last thing you want to do is spend him spending the whole night worried about what he'd done or didn't do. You know, he thought he'd made ready. And I'm, the reason I'm saying this story is that like if you're a commander, if you go out to a war, and you know, um, hopefully you won't go out to war, but if you do, is if your guys make a mistake on the front, as a commander, don't shout and scream at them because the, they've got to keep you alive for the rest of the night. And what this guy went on to do that whole night, because I didn't shout and scream at him, he, he performed really well. He, he took out some amazing targets with, with his GPMG. And that's what, what, what struck me was the fact of, the bravery that happened that night. I remember being in the corner and the gunfire coming down and no one sticking their head above the parapet, you know, talk about sticking it. And all I heard was section 200 meters on top of roof line, washing. He said, enemy, watch my tracer. And he just literally, we, we all, we, we then heard the, the GPMG firing off and Lammy was going left a bit, right a bit. These two, so Benny Boke and Lammy, were two private soldiers, but they were on the highest point of the Pink Palace, and the, the command, the fire and control orders. No one was, no one was saying shit. No sergeants were saying, no colour sergeants were saying anything. And this, just this superb fire control order. I can't remember. I can't do it any justice. But Lammy and Benny, and I wrote about it in my book that the fact that two private soldiers just took it among themselves, and that's what I've come across some of your channel watching. That someone might be good in the barracks. And the sergeants might be great, but what I realised was a lot of sergeants had kids, wife and children and stuff. A lot of the younger guys, because they don't have that. Now I'm, now I'm a father myself. If I was out there, I wouldn't have that. In, you know, like the younger the younger generation, because they've got, because they didn't have wife and children. In fact, that's wrong, actually, because Benny had kids, yeah. So, yeah, that was really brave of him to do that. But you, it's, you, you don't know who's going to come out of their shower of being... Um, a hero, if you like, in, in, a, in a, until the bullets are down, you know, and I, and I don't count myself at all as it is. <laughs> like, no way, no way am I going to stick my head above that parapet. You really see what people are made of when the bullets, or like what Tyson says, you know, you don't, you know, all, all plans got the window when you get hit in the face, you know, no plan survives first contact. Yes. And then, and then, uh, so the gunfire's going on, right? And then I got to a point where there was, um, a lull in the battle, things quiet down a bit, and then me and Brownie were we, we were covering our arcs, and I just see this guy coming down the road. He's got the AK forty seven. He's pointing out at me, and he's about to fire. He's pointing at me, and I hesitated. It's weird because you like you think, God, this is what I waited for, and I hesitated. And I heard, "What are you waiting for?" This was for something. Then he let rip, sergeant let rip, I let rip, and we're shooting at this target, you know, and he's firing back at us. And he, he, fall, he falls back he falls back and um, the, the smoke sort of clears and we all started screaming and shouting and then like the sergeant went you know get a grip be professional you know which which was the right thing to do because we it was almost like there was this exhilaration oh my god I've done it I finally shot someone killed someone but there was also a part of my soul I felt inside my soul that, that had died does that make sense, Chris? I, I felt like, right, I've done it now. I've shot someone. How do I feel? I don't feel <laughs> don't feel good about this. This is not a good feeling. It's like... is it? it we, do you know that you've killed him when you've shot him, or is it... Yeah, you, yeah, you've seen him fall down. Mm. God, I mean, the amount of rounds that came down at him, you know? Mm. And then his friend tried to come in and rescue him, like, and then we put rounds down to scare him away. Didn't shoot him just sort of like suppressive rounds to sort of like keep, because you don't know if he's going to fire back at us or whatever. And we then sent out a, a patrol to pull his body back. And then they pulled his body back and he's, he's in, he's in the courtyard. He's literally, I'm looking down the wall. like So I'm looking over the palace roof, looking down at this person we've shot. Brownie's looking down next to me and we're looking down and there's not, no one's saying anything and, and you can hear him <laughs> trying to breathe like, <laughs> like trying to get his last breath. And I remember that, that breathing, that like sucking chest wound that he had. Um, I will, you know, and it, it wasn't, it, it, I can't, I can't explain it. It just, I just didn't, I don't think anyone sat there and felt, felt great about it. You know? How many, mate, how many people suffered because of that? 
we talk like a bit trauma, you know, this sort of thing. Well, I'll get, I'll get, I'll get onto that at the end of the talk. You know, I'll talk about, you know, what, what everyone's sort of the the, the 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 amount of people that have died of suicide. But so the next day, within, you know, the, I remember the sunlight coming up, and I remember saying a prayer to God, saying, "Please let all my, just let everyone get back alive. Everyone from this rooftop, just let us get back alive." And my friend who'd been in lots of firefights, Liam, who's from Cornwall, you know, I knew he was down at Simic House. They were they were um down there and in the morning the sun came up i never just i just felt so grateful to be alive i can't describe it i was like and then we got brought off the we got relief off the roof and the roof just stunk of piss and congealed blood and you could smell the dead bodies that were down in the courtyard that people have brought back from the various firefights around the simic house and then we got taken back to to simic house for some for some food and we're getting that I've never tasted the best sausage I've ever tasted, the best egg, the best, you know, plum tomato, and just eating it and just being so grateful for every spoon in my mouth. And my mate going, fucking told you, and I fucking told you, it's fucking scary. And <laughs> like, yeah, this is fucking, I shit myself. Absolutely. I don't want any more now. I just want to go home. <laughs> I said, I'm not having more. Can I go home now? But it, but you're not here. And then, Right, guys, get your right kit on, you're back out again. You're tired, you're exhausted. That night, you know, so we did a whole day of riots again. I'm absolutely exhausted, no sleep. And then when you go into that third day, you know, you know, like, you start to get delirious, don't you? And then that night, they needed someone to go on a patrol. And I thought, I'm going to go out on a patrol. So I went out on a patrol to help this team out. Came back. And the next day, I think I probably saw three, three or four nights now, no sleep, killed someone. Uh, I'm just delirious, like, and they needed someone to go on the, the baseline again. They were down to go. So I was doing private soldier's role. Even though I was a full corporal, I was like, yeah, I'll be like, so, uh, pick up a six foot shield, go out. And then this guy comes down. He'd been doing it for days, coming down. And he was, he, he, I suppose in a way, he was like, he was like a simpleton. He didn't really, and he had two grenades in his hand. They kept coming up to the baseline. And Major Fawkes went, I want him taken out. I don't want him taken out, killed, but I want him, I wanted him arrested, right? So he would always come just close enough, but never too close. And he's got these grenades in his hand. I said, do you want a cigarette, mate? So I'm trying to lure him in with a cigarette. And like, boss says, I want you to apprehend him. So I didn't know if these grenades had pins in it or not. So give him a cigarette. He grabs the cigarette. And I said, do you want a light? So I go to light his cigarette and I just grab him and I just pull him in and I'm headbutting him and I'm, I'm beating the shit out of him and I've got him on the floor. I said, I've fucking had enough of this shit. I've had enough of you cunts. I've had enough of this fucking bullshit. And I'm punching him in the face, right? And then all I heard was, where be? Like that. And the, the grenades have already fallen out of his hand. And like, owl's gone. Pins are in, pins are in. Right, so I'm, I've fucking lost it. i have like, calm down. So this is my boss now saying, where be? Can't this major fork? He said, he made the right decision. I had lost it. He said, right, court officer, I want you to go up on the roof. Just calm down on the roof. So what you're hearing on that videotape from me then dropping that guy down, I'm fucking. Sick. I just want to kill. Some, I just want to kill some more people. I'm, I'm. I'm like, I've had it. I've had it with this shit. I've had it with the riots. I want to go home now. Go back on the rooftop, and the, the, the boss goes right. We're going to do a different tactics now. We're going to say we're going to just f fire a volley of, of batons in, and we're just going to run at these fuckers, and we're going to catch them, and we're going to. Um, we're going to apprehend them. The, the same kids, anyway, That about an hour later, a grenade comes over and blows my mate's toes off. My mate sat there resting behind the wall. The grenade comes over, blows his toes off. That was the that was it then. I think that had sent everyone over the, over the edge and like, right, no more grenades coming in now. We've had enough of this shit. And that was when you seen basically a, a group of, of, I won't name them who they are, but they go running into the group. And it's brave what they did. They're running into a crowd of a thousand people right with just their batting sticks on them. that's what they got their rifles are behind their backs right and they grab a couple of them and um bring them back around the wall and they give them a, they give them a kick in now the only the only two illegal blows that they do is they're kicking the nuts and the headbutt that you'll see on the videotape and i'm screaming and shouting on the roof because i've had enough i've had enough of this shit absolutely fell out of it days and days and days and days then chucking grenades over kicking off and the only thing they understand over there's kids on the other street right playing football 
these are, are throwing grenades, right? They're not innocent, right? If you want to chuck grenades at people, you want to chuck grenades at police, you're going to get a banning, right? That's what happens. So they get a kick in. Yeah, it doesn't look good on camera. People go, oh, they're children, you know. Yeah, but they're children with grenades, right? And those grenades can kill you. And we'd had enough of it. I turned around after I'd filmed that beating video and I dropped my camera and the camera broke and it wouldn't play back. And it's almost like a twist of fate. And you think, God, if that videotape had never played, well, I wouldn't have got caught. But would I still be alive? And that's what I always look back at. So when we came back from Iraq, that videotape, how it got into hands, I'm not going to go too much on that because it's in, it's in my film, it's in my book. You can read about it. But... I was suffering with PTSD. I know, I know I was suffering with post-traumatic stress disorder. I was, it was just a catalyst, a catalyst of violence going throughout. And when I got back from Iraq, Major Forks knew I had this footage on a videotape. So I put it onto a disc. We cut out, we cut out that obviously that beating scene because we knew the public wouldn't find that at all appealing. But because we seen our guys doing it, we didn't see anything wrong with it because that's what we were trained to do. So we just looked at that. Well, that's just standard procedure. So all the video footage, the, all the war stuff, right? This BBC journalist come over and uh, Major Fawkes sort of makes me do an interview with this guy. Um, I won't say his name, but he's a, you know, you probably can Google him. Um, he, he, he interviewed me and he saw all of the, the days of footage of, of all of that shit going on. Obviously, he didn't see that beating video clip. So that was in 2004, did that interview. Then I went off, got married, had kids. Uh, I, was a, I was training at ATL Winchester. When I was making the DVD, somebody helped me put this stuff from digital DV tape to convert it into... So you got DV tape, converted it onto a computer so you could store it on a hard drive or whatever, that footage, right? And if you know the old DV tapes, it's quite a procedure to, to get that now. Even now you've got to send, if you've got old DV tapes, you can send it away to be put into digital format. And I didn't know how to do it. And this one guy did, two people in our battalion knew how to do it. One came back to me and said, oh, I couldn't do it. And then he, he was the only person I let the videotapes sort of out of my hands for... And then he got kicked out for drugs and he also didn't like some members of 1LI because of his situation. And he sold it to the News of the World for eight grand. That's what I got told anyway. Um, so that, um, that video got sold to News of the World and I was at ATL Winchester. So two years down the line, 2006 arrived and then basically... I was at ATL Winchester at the pinnacle of my career, just about to get my sergeant, and then it comes out, the beating video gets released, and my career's over, you know? I get um, I get arrested by the SIB, and they were so... I can't describe it. I'm... The only way I'd describe it is like being... The way I looked at it was like being being caught behind enemy lines, because all they wanted to do was, was arrest the people that I'd served with, and to send them down, destroy their careers. And when I'd asked this SIB sergeant, I said, have you served in Iraq? He's like, no. He said, I did a bit of Bosnia and that was it. He said, but he hadn't served in Iraq. And he, he was so wanting to send me down and all these, all of us down. So I just told him the way I looked at it, I remember reading Bravo 2-0 and Andy McNabb said in Bravo 2-0, every time I just gave my name, rank and number, it was just, it's like my war now was with the SIB, the Special Investigations Bank. My war now was with the military police because they were going to try and take my guys out and that ain't going to happen. These guys kept me alive in, in Iraq. So I, I, I then went on my mission then to give them names of people that didn't even go to Iraq, that had been out years. I knew would give them a, a wild goose chase, which would give me time then to then relate to the people I served with. That we So... We, so they were the enemy. That was it. SIB, enemy. Military police, enemy. I remember the night I got arrested, they put me in a police cell in Oldershot in one of the guard rooms. And um, I was being, they go, I went to, was it? Guard commander told me, he goes, every hour they woke me up. He said, right, I have to sleep on the bed with the lights on. And they, they, they left the lights on in the cell. And every hour, he would just, just check the cell. I think they were doing the suicide work, but they would do it really loud to try and wake me up. So I had no sleep all night. And then uh, they made me stand to attention on the yellow line. And I looked on the, 
I looked on, on the guard room TV and it had just like the, the beating video was being played in the guard room TV and all of these texts were coming up. These these are just these are disgraced soldiers. These people should have their pensions take off and they should their careers destroyed, send them to prison, all of this stuff. It was just like, oh my God. Um, what is going on? And then that BBC journalist who knew the three days of the he had all he had all the footage. The BBC did nothing to back us up. They just showed that beating clip. It didn't show in context what had gone on. I was like, no one's going, no one's going to, no one's going to, no one's going to back you up here. That BBC journalist not going to back you up. So I, I was like, sat down with the, um, sat down with the guard commander. The new guard commander came in. He was really sound with me. He said, right. He said, Court Webster, let's go for scoff fights. We're having scoff, having scram, you'd call it, in in the galley with a couple of words. <laughs> So we're sitting there and he just goes, look, mate, I'm going to give you some advice. He said, don't tell those fuckers anything because they're going to do everything to, to send you. They're going to want scapegoats. Because he was the, he's the only person who goes, when we get back, you can ring anyone, right? You can ring your mum, your dad, you can ring, you know, your wife, you can ring. He said, he was sound with me. He said, but don't give these monkey bastards anything. I went, I went back and I, I just, I just made that decision that I was now at war with the SIB, the special base. I don't know what they call special engagements, Burks, whatever they're called. I just, um, I was just, I felt so let down by the by, by the British Army for not protecting me. And then all day, our name hadn't been released, and they needed something because the media were asking, right, who is it? Who's done? This? Who's done this? And I'm getting this shit. They're also. I look back and think, well, I'm only laughing on the camera. Right? I'm actually doing the beat, but I'm taking the rap for it because I'm the one who's vocalising it on the on the camera. So all day I managed to uh, to not give these police anything, and then the policeman the SIB guy goes, right, because because you've not given us anything and you've given us false names and you've given us you've given us the runaround. He said. We're going to release your without because we're going to release your details to the six o'clock news. Um, he goes, Sue, so, he goes, you're going to, you're going home in a minute. If I was you, I'd tell your wife to pack the house up and get out because you're going to have the world's media on your doorstep. And I was like, what? I said, but you haven't charged me. He said, well, you should have helped us out then, shouldn't you? So I had to ring. Um, so basically, had to get my family down to Cornwall to evade capture from the media get back to the kit so we have half an hour to pack up our our house at winchester um there was there was um like a an army uh police vans and all that lot to protect the streets so i could go down and get all my stuff and then i went down to cornwall and hit sister-in-law's house for a couple of days and then like i said i had a day to go down there and then the HR Winchester said, you've got to come back immediately. So I came back. I was suicidal at this point. I was like, I didn't want to, I was just thinking, I, I thought if I kill myself, then that's going to protect my family. That's the way I looked at it. If I, if I Mark, kill myself, then that. Mark, try not to move around. It, there's a lot of background noise, dude. It'll ruin, the, ruin the audio. No, it's all right. You get, you, you're getting into your story. I can see that. So, you know, I'm, I just couldn't believe how let down I felt, you know, and then I, I go back to, the, uh, I go back to, um, HL Winchester and I was in the top 10 corporals at HL Winchester for training recruits so I really loved that job and I just trained my first group of raw engineers and they said look even though you're in the top 10 recruits we're going to give you a choice and you've done really well at HL Winchester we'll give you a choice of where do you want to do you want to go the closest we can get you to Cornwall will be Bulford with the green jackets so I said I want to sign off immediately I want to get out and they were like well you can do that when you get down to the Royal green jackets and they were deploying to Iraq. And I was like, oh, God, so this is like a nightmare. I was like, what am I going to do? So I I remember um, we were sitting in the office and our <laughs> son comes out and he goes, apparently you've been to Iraq. And he chucks me my Iraq medal. <laughs> so I'm sat there like that. And I looked at him. I just felt sick. I just felt, you know, I just felt, so I'm sat there with this medal. And I'll, um, the regiment was just about to amalgamate into the rifles as well. So. Anyway, I go to Bulford and I get to Bulford and they're like, right, you're going to deploy to Canada first and then you're going to deploy to Iraq. I said, I'm not. I ain't going anywhere. And they went, you are. And I went, I'm not. I said, I'll be off the Canada or back by this afternoon. Went straight down to see the, the psych 
And she and I said, right, I'm gonna kill myself. And I said, right, <laughs> right up the fuck, Captain. I went back, fucking stick your fucking Canada up your ass, you prick. I was like that with them now. I didn't give a shit. I was like, and then they went, right, we'll put him as a DMI because I was the driver maintenance instructor for Bulldogs. So I'd done all that course so I could train people up. They took the old 432, put a new Bulldog in. So I was trained in APCs. And the, the fucking, the army had just gone to shit. They were just pumped. They were they were spending millions in Bilford, literally around the corner from our camp. They were build. they spent millions on building a new court martial centre to trial all of the war criminals that were coming back from Iraq. Not Tony Blair, all of us lot, all of us like scapegoats that were getting picked apart. And all of this was smoke screens for the shit that those bastards had done, the dodgy dealings they'd done beyond, you know, all the, the Iraqis that they let down, not providing infrastructure, not having an illegal, not not having a legally backed war by the UN, no no rules of engagement. I mean, how could they really try me, really? What are they going to try me for? No rules of engagement, no correct equipment, illegal war. How can how can how can they possibly be a kangaroo court? Mm. So I'm at Bullford. I'm pretty pissed at the army. I'm like that. The army's the enemy now, and I'm doing everything I can to get out, and I don't want anything to do with it. So, but I, I still have my, I still have, I still have my principle. So I had to train up these guys before they go up to Iraq. Uh, so I'm training up four, three, two drivers and, and commanders before they go. Sorry, bulldogs now. They're called bulldogs. So I went up to Catterick to train up another regiment. Um. The uh, two, two RGJ, so the second battalion, all green jackets are going up to Iraq. So I'm at one RGJ, no, I'm at two RGJ, and I'm going up to train one RGJ in Catrick, right? So I got there, and we're getting these new bulldogs, and these bulldogs were basically taking a, a new engine and plonking it into um, an old and into an old vehicle. Uh, I've been I've been tasked. I'm based at Bulford. I'm working with uh, two RGJ. I've been tasked to go up to Catterick uh, because they've got bulldogs up there and they're going to train up one IGJ to take the bulldogs to deploy to Iraq. So both RGJs, the Royal Green Jackets, you've got uh, 1st Battalion Royal Green Jackets, 2nd Battalion Royal, and I'm obviously 1st Battalion Light Infantry. We do our training with Royal Green Jackets. Massive respect for both of those regiments. Um, in fact, I'll, you know, I could never say they're better regiments, but what they're, they're the Royal Green Jackets are less bullshitty than the light infantry. Like the light infantry were more, um, I wouldn't say bullshitty regiments, but they they like their kit press. Whereas the Green Jackets would, would would not have their press kit. They they're more into like their tactics and stuff like that. They're um, one of I was was renowned for being Starch Battalion. <laughs> Starch using starch on the uh, the no, no, no one's going to know what starch is these days, are they? I don't know. Let's go get a bag, go get a bottle of starch. That red, what if you can buy starch though, mate? What about wiring a plug? Everything comes with a plug on it now, doesn't it? I've got a little story about the plugs. Remind me that later to tell you the story of the plug. You used to have to get a test on your plug, and you had a. So well, anyway, these right. So to take the old four three two vehicle and put a brand new engine in it that's, that's got to be monitored by a computer, right? All anyone who's done armored roll, the four three two. If you're a driver, you can basically say you're driving along and you put you're pulling over or you're stopping in a in a big built up city while the vehicle's idling. You can literally check your oils. You can check your gearbox oil. You can check your engine oil. You can do all of that from the driver's compartment. So the driver can be doing all that while being protected by the rest of the, the team that are in the vehicle. Right, really important if you're using armoured vehicles so have all of your, you know, the vehicle is maintained correctly, same as your rifle. Um, so I'm a driver maintenance instructor, which wasn't a choice because I couldn't stand tanks. I couldn't stand using them hate flipping things right and i didn't join the army to be a tanky um i know they're apcs but so i'm there training up well, as a driver mate instructor one rgj they turn up none of them ever want to do it as well infantry don't want to learn about tanks right they just want to get in and fucking do the job right so turn up mark wilch is there mate of mine and he's from one li and he's been assigned to the devil and dorsets 
and the Devon and Dorset Regiment were better in Carrick. They were gone. They'd gone. They deployed to Iraq, to Iraq, and this is how bad it got. Right? They've deployed to Iraq. They've got a block of accommodation, and they said, right, Court Webster, that we're going to put all of one RGJ drivers in that block there. So I went in the block, and all they'd done was they they basically broke open the rooms. So my room, I walk into this room. It's got an MFO box. You remember when you go on 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 a tour. All your, all your kit gets packed up in a box and put into a locker, right? So that's, that's, people's, that's people's rooms, right? And all they can, all, all they can, um, all, all I can see in this, in this, in this room is like a sink and the sink had been smashed in half. So it was like Willy Wonka's room, you know, the half the sink and <laughs> I got half the sink. I'm in somebody else's room while they deployed to Iraq. I thought, this is terrible. The first thing the green jacket started doing was when so a lot of them were scousers, was owning up the MFO boxes and, and pilfering through the guy's kit. That had been... <laughs> oh, God. Then we came with the 432s with the new Bulldogs, right? The Bulldogs don't work, right? They've got brand new engines in, right? We don't understand how it all properly works. Even though I've gone on course to use these, you need computers to check whether things are not working. But the air filtration system... Um, if it gets clogged up there, the old air filters, you could you could open the louvers, take them out, give them a tap, right, and ch- clear all the sand off of your, which is your air filter. Obviously, that helps the tank, the air, the 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 engine cool down. If it gets clogged up with sand, then the engines are not going to work correctly. So we've got all these things that are going wrong. The, the new bulldog, you have to open the steering hatch so the driver has to stop, get out, open up the steering hatch, and check. And the new the new oil thing whatever used to be the hold the oil before you know was on the top of the tank now it's on the side of the tank so it's literally pissing out some clown had designed this right puts a, and it's got like a rubber bung in it so the, there was nothing wrong with the old engine the way it was all designed some clever twat come up with all these little new and it wasn't working so we're driving up the a1 in newcastle pissing oil all over the road and i get back and i went these guys are going to, they're going to be dealing with all these mechanical problems and then dealing with being in a conflict zone. So I'm like going back to the, uh, my colour sergeant, Dave Brettel, and his boss, this OC, this major from the guards, whatever. And I just said, look, boss, these vehicles are VR, all of them are VR wide. We haven't got any pack lifting equipment. We can't take the, the we can't, we can't fix these vehicles. I said, I need, I need a Remy uh, LED, you know, someone who, who knows how to work, how to fix these vehicles. He said, Court Webster, don't give me problems, give me solutions. I want all these drivers qualified by the end of the week. I said, I can't, they're all via, the vehicles aren't working. What am I supposed to do? He said, don't give me problems, give me solutions. I went, all right. So I went into the guard room, look on the board, and on the board it had like who the head of command was. And there at the top was now a brigadier, was my old CEO from, from the past, um, the SES guy. So I'm like looking and thinking, right, fuck it. He's going he's gonna to sort this out. So I ring him up and I said, can I speak to the Brigadier, please? And they said, who's this? I just said, it's Court Webster from one of I knew he'd picked up. So I get this. And anyway, he said, Court Webster, what are you doing? <laughs> ring me up. You don't ring, you know, and for any audience, know, a corporal doesn't ring a Brigadier up, do they? It doesn't happen, does it? No. You wouldn't ring a... Huh? No, it's like somebody on the production line ringing the chief executive. It's... It, it, just saying shit not going down right right i said listen boss i said i said i'm training your commanders up right? and they're going out and board because i didn't even know i had bulldogs on the cap so he didn't even know right so he's going and he knows to know everything right i'm trying not to say his name because he wouldn't be happy but and he he's like right he, he said who's i said they're just telling me to qualify these people i'm out i'm out in i'm out in six weeks time right and you want me to tra- qualify these people? I said, you need to come. And he goes, right, I'll be down in 10 minutes. He goes, tell, tell your OC, right, that I'm, I want to speak to him. So I go back to the, I said, you know, you said, give me problems. He goes, I don't want problems, give me solutions. So I said, well, the brigade commander's coming down. <laughs> <He> went, <laughs> who, who rang him? I said, I did. I said, because you weren't listening. I said, so, I said, I'm out in six weeks. So I can't give a shit, right? You can boss me now to private. I don't care. I've had enough. I said, those vehicles are dangerous. You're going out and you've asked me, I said, so you better explain it to the brigadier. So anyway, this car pulls up. It's got, it's got John King in it. And um, he's basically, uh, he's someone from Falmouth. He's the, he's the colonel, he's the brigadier's driver. 
and he's scruffy as hell. He gets out, smokes, lights a cigarette. The brigadier walks up. He's got jungles on. His, his berries on. His brigadier berry. And he goes to the OC. He goes, right, I'll speak to you two in a minute. And, the, uh, and, the, and his captain. Those two are just like gone into shock because like, they know they're going to get it. And I've got like all these vehicles on parade with VOR, VOR, VOR. And I pull out my little pen and I go, right, sir, this is a fault. This is a fault here. This is a fault. This is this needs to be rectified. I said, I've been given all these drivers I've got to qualify in the next um, in the next hour. Um, in the next hour, in the next couple of days. I said, I can't do it. I said, I need LAD to do a plaque lift on these, get these vehicles. He just turns around to the RSM of the LAD and he goes, right, you lot will work around the clock and you'll give Corporal Webster the vehicles he needs and also make sure um, this is and this is all done. And then he pulls me to one side. He goes, he goes so what happened in Iraq? <laughs> so I'm there like, I went, well, I said, screwed up, didn't I? He said, oh, I knew that was you. I said, oh, I recognised your voice on the camera. He goes, you stupid boy. And uh, he goes, do you want to come back out to Iraq with me? He said, I'll, he offered me a job to come out and be part of his team. And I said, honestly, sir, I said, I would, I would go out to Iraq with you. I said, but I said, honestly, I don't want anything to do with the army anymore. I said, the way we, me, and, me and John have been treated, I said, it's, it's diabolical. I said, we've had our names put in the papers. We've had all this happen to us. And then I said another thing. I said, John's not even done this 22 years and he's not even been given his... He used to get a silver bugle for doing it 22 years. I said, the regiment have snubbed him and not given him his bugle. And he goes, right. And I go, okay. Right. And, I, and I said, um, I said, you know, are we all waiting to get... I said, John's waiting to get out. I'm waiting to get out. And I said, we just... We can't get out until this court-martial's over. And he goes, oh, okay. So... That day, I'd fit, a couple of days later, I'd qualified all these drivers and I drove, because I was in North, I was in North England, I went to Black, I went to um, uh, where my mate lives and I went and I went and seen him in the North East, this John character. So I go there and I said, oh, I've just seen Brig the Brigadier. And he went, funny old thing, you should say that. He goes, look what I got. And he's, he's there with the silver bugle. He said, I said, what happened there? He goes, oh, he made, um, he made, he made a captain personally drive from Germany to hand deliver the bugle <laughs> he, met, he, he had a lot of persuasion this guy you know really not, and I really do believe he played a part in in briefing up Whitehall in what what we'd been through and getting things I wouldn't say brushed under the carpet but what was the final silver bullet and I was told this as well was I'd managed to get a sneaky copy, copy of what had happened to my friend who's in a band called the Ley Lines. And he used to be in the army. He's in a, he's in a, a, a rock band called the, the Ley, not rock band, a folk rock band called the Ley Lines. And he's, so they're doing, they're doing quite well. And he knows a few people in the media. And I knew he would act like my spin doctor and getting this story out there. So he run the news of the world, pulled the news of the world in, and he had a copy of my DVD with all the original footage on. So he did what the BBC should have done and, and backed us up and said, look, hang on. There's all this footage you're not showing all the full story you're just showing a clip of what happened so he got and then he got andy mcnab in and andy mcnab or whatever his real name is he's he's at raw green jacket apparently he he wrote a story in the sun and the story was hang on we've not seen the full picture here and i think we've jumped to conclusions these guys were under attack and he was the first person to come out and defend us so i will always have I'd like to personally thank Andy Benab for backing us up. You know, when when you when everyone in the country is like these are scumbags, he's like this. You know, he was the first person to to back us up, and the second person to back us up was Jeremy Clarkson. Jeremy Clarkson came out and wrote a piece because he'd been out to Iraq, and he had an art. He, when he was in one of the the when he was out in one of the helicopters, he got fired at, and they, they fired an, AP, uh, an RPG at him. Some some. Um, insurgent fired an RPG at him and he said it was so frightening and he said because he'd experienced that in Iraq he said he he just made his own assumptions people need to be know the full picture of what's going on out there before they make judgments on us so they was the two interviews when I was really struggling my dad had cut those newspaper pieces out and I remember keeping them you know because they were like just somebody fighting our corner because we didn't have a lot of people fighting our corner everyone was like you know judging us um, and that was it. Got out of the army. I remember handing my ID card in, and that was it. You know, finished. 
And then within a, a year, two years, I'd started work on my own documentary. I met, I met up with that BBC journalist, right, because he contacted me. And he, he said sorry to me. He said, I'm really sorry. I, I, my boss wouldn't let me put the full picture. He said it just wasn't in the, it wasn't in the public interest. You know? And I just said to him, and I was friends with him for a few years on Facebook. And I recently deleted him because he because I put some shit about the BBC about them not reporting the full facts again. And he came back with something towards me saying, well, they have. Report. And I said, they even go there, mate. I said, because you shit on us years ago. And I just said, I just I just let him on a private message. I just said, you you knew the facts and you didn't tell the facts to the public. The BBC knew what the facts were, but they decided like Jimmy Savile stuff and all the rest of the shit, mate, they the buried B it. Mate, we, we need to clarify this. The BBC don't decide. It's decided for them. I, I totally get that, you know. And <sighs> The BBC, folks at home, if you still think the BBC is this quaint, you know, archetypal British Auntie Beeb organisation that brings you wonderful nature, donkey, which it does, but it's called the, um, we call it the shit cracker in this family. It, it's where you, you have the wonderful nature documentary that everyone dines out on and they're lovely mm. soap operas or whatever. And then the other side of it is the, the spin, the, um, what, what you've been, what they've put you through. And I, we, we need to get away from the minutiae of thinking it's some guy in the BBC that's just a fucking bastard. It's not. They're, they're controlled. Right? They're, it, it's the same way. Uh, look at Jordan Peterson when he was on that. I think it was a Channel 4. Mm. Was it Kathy so-and-so? She was. She kept trying to destroy the guy, and he just wiped the floor with her and made her look utterly ridiculous. But the reason she kept going in, getting smashed, not taking the cue, and then coming back in and try was she's been told by her hierarchy what the angle is what she's got to go for and they're mm. controlled by by the powers above them right so sorry Matt, well, I, 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 I didn't I, mean to interrupt you but it's no that's all right now you because I, I did I did an, there's a there's a documentary out called once upon a time in Iraq so when I came out and I I did this interview with the guy and I said um I didn't do an interview with him I did a uh, we met up for a cup of tea and I always remember him like laughing and joking, going, yeah, it's all paid for. He would pay for food. Like we'd go for a meal and he'd go, right. He was trying to butt me up because what they wanted to do was do it. He said, we could get possibly 20 grand. We could pay you 20 grand and you would do a, a, a talk about us and you'll get your point of view across of what happened in Iraq. And I was like, I, you know, I, I was already on the verge of like bankruptcy and losing my house and my, my, my um, you know, previous marriage was over and living in my car and that money, but I just couldn't, I just, and then I remember I was, I was just on the fringes of making Diary of a Disgraced Soldier. So I like all the artwork you see in Diary of a Disgraced Soldier. So I started getting on the verge of madness. So I was painting all these pictures and I, I even hired like this room where I just keep all these pictures. So I was like making my own gallery. And I remember bringing this, this executive from BBC, he was called Dimitri something or whatever, and he came along and I remember him laughing, laughing at the paintings and him and Scott, Scott was laughing at what, what, and I remember thinking, don't do it, don't, don't go with these people, they're, they're going to make a mockery of it, they're going to make a mockery of you, they're going to exploit your family, they're going to, they want it to, so I just turned around to them and and I said, no, I'm going to make this documentary with these three students. <laughs> I met, I've met these three students from Falmouth University, Rich Atkinson, Neil Cole, um, and Chris Rowe. And I just said, me, me and Chris Rowe went to the meeting with the two BBC. I said, can you come along with me? And I remember turning around to this BBC guy, he goes, no, I'm not, I'm not doing it with you guys. And he was so angry. And the beat, this, this, BBC journalist who's been with me, you know, trying to persuade me. He says, you'll never make this documentary. You'll never get it off. And I was like that then. That's the best thing you could have said to me. I'm going to fucking make this film for bankruptcy. It did. <laughs> it did. It did. But, you know, I literally went, now I'm going to make this film. So I made that documentary, you know, that one there. And I'm, and I'm proud of it. You know, it only went to one film festival and that got in through... 
um, that got that got in because we had somebody in the film festival that took the DVD that was at the bottom of the pile and put it at the top of the pile. <laughs> Again, it was like, mine. Can we just backtrack a bit? How? <clears throat> what was the kind of linchpin um, that you didn't get prosecuted for any of that? I mean, I, I'm not saying you should have been prosecuted. So, so remember, remember, but... I remember, I remember, I gave that footage to. My friend uh, Steve Mitchell, who does the band Ley Lines, and he then gave it to News of the World journalist, who then gave it to, um, who gave it to Andy Benag to review. So because of that incident, because of me doing that, right? When I was waiting for when I was waiting to get discharged from the army, right? I remember somebody gave me a number for the MOD press office. And what I would do is I'd ring up every day and I said, any news yet on our court martial, any news yet? And I, what I did is I, I almost harassed him to death. No court webster, no news on your court martial, no news on your court martial. Every day, rang him up. And this media press office goes, uh, court webster, no, we've got no information. Next day, so any news on our, uh, on our court martial date? No. And then it got to Christmas time in 2006. I'm, I think I got out 2007. It might have been Christmas, coming up for Christmas time 2006. And it was Christmas time. And they were giving out this media press office officer. I rang him up and he was drunk. He said, Court Webster, I'm so fed up with you ringing me. He said, If I tell you this information, you promise never to ring me again. I went, yeah. He went, Right. He said, The news of the world are going to back you guys. They're going to, they're going to, they're going to play. They're going to back you guys now because they, they've got the full footage. And what they've said to us, so, the, so basically the news of the world, even though they exposed us, we're then going to, we're going to play, <laughs> we're going to then back us. So as the media then, as, so as we would be tried at Bulford, right, in this new court that they were building, especially to try all these war criminals, supposedly war criminals, the media would then back us. So it was a perfect story for them. So then the, the MOD backed off and went, that's going to have massive egg on our faces, right? So he told me the full, he said, because the news of the world have the full footage and going to back you guys, we're backing off and we're going to drop all the charges. So the Crown Prosecution Service dropped everything, all the charges. on it. I was getting charged with Section 69. I mean, it's like someone's made it, oh, what do we call it? I'll call it Section 69. That's funny, isn't it? Yeah. Section 69, mocking Iraqi civilians while being beaten with sticks. That's what my charge was. It's, all, it's almost like they made it up. Because I didn't see it in the military law manual that I stole when I, when I left the... <laughs> mm. Anyway, so so that's why it all got dropped. The Crown prosecutions, we were dropped with no charge. We it was all dropped with no charges, all found not guilty. Uh, but Major Forks had his career ruined. Um, John was prevented, even though I'd done this full 22 years, he had to spend a whole year in the army and none of their names were, only me and Major Fawkes' names were released to the press. You know, mine was released first and Major Fawkes, what they did is they, they did, they, they released his name to the press and um, they tried to, they tried to make a big thing about it. Mm -hmm. He was such a good commander, you know, such a, you know, he's, I think he's still in. Can we it's talk just about super... the, the, the thing that come across in your documentary, which is a bloody good achievement, mate. You know, it really, really is. And I, I'm one of these, you know, and never look back, only look forward. And there's no such thing as a bad experience. You know, no. there's some things we wouldn't do again, then that's fine. But yeah. it, it, it takes us forward to this better, better place. Um, so congratulations on the documentary. <clears throat> but what I wanted to talk about is, I think the thing is so visceral and, and, you, and is you can see that you're a man pushed to the limit of what anyone is supposed to enjoy. You can see that in your, in, in, in your frustration and your anger and your your sense of outrage at, at being in this unique limited bunch of people that actually get this, you know, that have been subjected to this and have been victim to it. And also uh, when I um, podcasted with major Andy Shaw, 
mm. who was the Royal Marine chap that that um, was in a blue on blue engagement in the Falklands. So uh, uh, one patrol shot up another patrol uh, on the same side, obviously. And there was one point in his uh, that podcast where he went, no, Chris, shut up. He didn't say, you know, he meant it like, no, let, you, let me speak, right? And he said, this is PTSD talking, right? And I was like, I'm all here, <laughs> you know. Uh, it, yeah. it, it was palpable. I could see, you know, and, yeah, i seen that in my own behaviour many times over the over the years it it's um yeah i don't know can, can we explore that in some the the the, 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 the i see it in my eyes when I, when, I, when i watch that video back it's almost like it's almost like a demonic possession that's the only way i can describe it like it's all soldiers you, if you watch mike tyson interviews there's another guy that i'm fascinated by especially because you know you can go from like crying in tears to one minute like you know and he's like a like a, he's like a tiger that's been let off, off a leash and probably why he smokes a lot of pot to keep himself ch chilled and subdued and like with me i've never had i've never been into if i smoked cannabis it made me really paranoid if i took any form of drugs it would have the opposite effect on me because I'm, I'm my brain's mad enough as it is i you know did magic mushrooms before i joined um, the army when i was at art school and you know <laughs> that was another another level of you know of experience that i'm a very spiritual person and i i believe that you know you can be open to but everyone has their shadow side carl young talks as i've done all the therapy stuff for the last 10 years Carl Young talks about your shadow side, investigating your shadow side, your dark side. Everyone has a dark side. And what soldiers do, they tap into an uncharted primal evil resource. And we all have that ability to snap and it's on, you know, it's like, but at the same time, being able to control that, it's it's got to be, it's got to be controlled and measured. And that's probably what special forces people look for. They look for, can this guy contain this? Can it be? And I, I'm, I've struggled over the years. What I find hard with is, is, going back to that scared little boy you know at the age of seven that going through that torture it's like when i made that decision this will never ever happen to me again you know the guy that did that to me friend requested me a few years ago and i looked at the picture on his profile and i thought you're so lucky that i've been through 10 years of therapy because if i hadn't when i came out of the army you know I, I could have done something serious to this guy, but because I'd been through 10 years of therapy, I got to that place of peace inside myself to realise that I can, can control this aggressive behaviour because it's not, it's not good. It's, it's not, you can't be a productive member of society. And for the last 10 years, I've worked with so many violent, aggressive people and get them to a point where they can find peace and then meet some, meet their soulmate, meet someone they truly love and find and love themselves. You know, it's all do, about loving do, yourself. Do we find them, mate? I just, want to get all this out that the alcohol for people like ourselves is problematic right it big time it, it big time. unleashes the fucking beast i, I um, think i think if you've done loads of shadow if you know what i mean by shadow work if you've done loads of like i can have a beer and I, the thing is if someone's drinking as an addict to to bury something that that's dangerous if someone like now i can drink a can of guinness with a with a meal Right, and I really enjoy that. But if I started to drink lots of them, then that could unleash things in me that, that perhaps I, that's why, but I've never been into alcohol, I've never been into drugs like that. I've never been that type of, depends on your, on your, the person, perhaps it's in my upbringing because my mum and dad didn't drink or smoke or those are things that they were traits that I, I sort of took on to fit in with, with military life. Mm. But they weren't, they weren't things that I particularly grew up enjoying like that, really. I did it because it was part of the military there just seems to be this really strong connection of people that have been through childhood trauma that then get to adulthood and then go through something again. And then they not only come out of it a stronger, more productive, you know, they say member of society, don't they? But they are a more spiritual person. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's they wouldn't have done that had they not had the trauma as a kid. Totally. 
I possibly would never have gone in the military because those, you know, that like that boy that I mentioned at the beginning of the interview that, you know, he went through that beating at the age of, you know, I must have been eight or nine watching my friend who's older than me get that kick in. And it's still, it's still clear in my head. Watching that experience, you think that the world is then full of violent, dangerous people. And it's not. It, there's a full of a lot of good people as well. It just happened to be those scenarios of trauma that I went through as a kid then dictate the path that I took, you know. But then if I, say, for instance, that video camera, if I turn around that twist of fate of that video not being sure, if, I, if that video didn't come out, would I have not have then seen what I'd become, this really aggressive, violent person, to then... To then look to then to heal to to heal from war, you know. And and the thing is now I realise that there's more power in not fighting. There's more peace in your life than not being aggressive, not being like that. But sometimes you have got to set a boundary with people, you know. Why? Why is it then? Because I could see you now the, the video where you were so pent up, frustrated. It's, if someone had said to you then, right, here's an SA-80, there's Bush and there's Blair, and listen, I don't want to say the words here because I don't want to get, 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 get us into shit again, but... No, no, but, I, I, but listen, I, no, I, no one, you're not going to get prosecuted. I know that your thoughts have been where mine have. Do you know what? I don't have any... I don't have any... When I, I was angry then, but because I've done so much work on myself, how do I feel now? I don't feel any, that's the thing, it's forgiveness. You've talked about it on the podcast, you talked about it with Robbie Williams, or, you know, about the forgiveness, is finding that place of forgiveness. Even doing this interview today, I feel like there's still work I've got to do on forgiveness around the BBC, there's forgiveness I've got to do around that interviewee, there's, there's forgiveness around the SIB, that I could feel anger coming up in me around the military police and the, uh, and I feel like I need to work on those things myself in the next few weeks. I'm going to work on them because it's all about shaving off those layers of the onion. So like today, this, this interview is about me going, looking, looking back and reflecting and going, I haven't spoken about, I, I did speak about this two years ago and I, I became really upset because I went and did a BB, another BBC with that Once Upon a Time in Iraq documentary that was being made. And then I, they spent months um nurturing me that one of the producers who I got on really well with and he was like you're going to get to have your say and I've, well, I've had my say in Diary of a Disgraced Soldier why do I need to have my say again I, I know the film will probably never make the light of day or never come on BBC channel it'll never be shown on channel four because it's too real it's too visceral it's too hey look this is what went on and the people don't want to know the truth so you know if you want to know the truth watch the film it's free on the virus channel you'd have to pay for it mm. um but I was, I did this documentary called Once Upon a Time in Iraq. And when I went on it, they were like, the, the producer was like, we want to talk to Webby. And I went, well, I am Webby. That person, what they wanted, was they, they thought I was like a split personality. That is me. That is an aggressive side of me. That if you provoke and if you bear bait that person, you could, you could initiate that if you want that. All but right, they tried to do that. They tried to do that in the interview, and one of the one of the the interviewee, a female interviewee, first of all, she asked me what I voted on Brexit, and then when I told her that I voted Leave on Brexit, she completely changed towards me. She was being aggressive. She all day she just provoked me, bear baited me, and then went on to me tried to associate with me having some sexual disorder with with what I'm saying on the camera, and I said. Then all I did was I just kept calm, I kept collective, and because I wouldn't react in the way that the BBC journalists wanted to react, they didn't put me in a documentary because they wanted to see a nutter on TV. And because I because I didn't fulfil what they wanted, I came back and my missus said, "You're right," and I said, "No." And I spent three days in my bed. I felt sick. I felt sick. I felt I felt violated. I felt abused. And suicidal thoughts come up in my head and I had that hadn't come up for years and I thought what if these people interview someone who's I had helped them the next few days I had help from therapists that I've worked with over the last few years what if they interviewed somebody and they went off and killed themselves they don't care these these big corporations all they care about is their stupid documentary and I hope I hope they get their next BAFTA for once upon a time in Iraq it's called but I didn't feature in it because I didn't play to their tune I didn't dance to their tune 
good. And it's just sad. It's just sad, Chris. It's sad that these people have controlled the narrative for so long and they're just, oh. Oh, it, <sighs> I, I could say so much about it. it it's, it's just a horrible insid- insidiousness <laughs> in, in that whole... That they just whole. want to betray the, the soldiers how they want to betray them. And, yeah. You know, when I, wa- I watched your interview recently with Robbie Williams, I was dry- I was um I was listening to it in the car and I was driving back and the way he spoke about the way he spoke about military guys, because he's worked with special forces guys doing the close protection film, the love he had for them, the fact that the soldiers will do, they'll give their life for their for their country. And that's what, what I was willing to do, was give my life for the country. And it, it made me emotional to hear him speaking with such fondness towards military personnel because they are and I do I do love military personnel I, I I love the ethos I love hearing the stories from the old and the younger generations and it's just it's a yeah. privilege to be part of I don't regret any you know I wouldn't be doing this now with you if I hadn't joined up so for me it's been character building <laughs> <laughs> yeah for Rob it's you got to remember everyone in the, everyone he's surrounded by a, a, a you know they come with a the honey in this hand and, and the knife in, in this hand and, and his bouncers, his, his security mm. will lay down their lives for Rob. Yeah. And they must be such a, you know, he's in an industry which is, people, people die in that industry quite, quite frequently and in yeah. very suspicious circumstances. And, but what I wanted to come on to is I, I've had, I've had this conversation before in a podcast is, like, I, I get you that we have to find peace in our hearts. I, I, I get that. But we're, and, and I hear people say a lot, we're, it's a spiritual war, right? And I, I, I kind of get that. But what I... I, I, I really wonder if this is the last sort of key in, or piece in some sort of jigsaw to work out to get the ultimate peace of mind in this life. Because I, I consider myself enlightened. I certainly am not a left brain person <clears throat> and that has all the stresses that left brain people do, you know, the mortgage, the the you know does my ass look big in this and all that all that stuff right but martin when you see um what this agenda is doing to our young people you've only got to look out of the window and see their loss of freedom their damage the damage that's been done to them right not to, not just not just young people, people now have lost the ability to say hello when they walk down the street. It's just awful. You get a father of a, and this is not, this is not everybody. Of course it's not. I've got, you know, I'm not lumping. I'm saying in general, because I'm out running a lot or I'm out cycling, Mm. you know, I come past the family. There's dad, a bit podgy because, you know, he's got, He's got the mat, the two thousand pound mountain bike for Christmas because someone's prompted him to get. He's got the the silly lycra on. He's got his partner behind behind him and three kids in tow. And you cycle along and you go. Just, I get it. I I think I know what that is. It's just complete loss of self. Damaged so much by society through the the fear based culture that we've been brought up in. Do you, do you not do you not have faith though? I, I I'm, I'm a big believer in. It's like well, I look who I am now. If I look at that hole I was when I made diary. If I look at that hole I was in there, I got myself out of that. Obviously with the help of family, friends, and loved ones, and you know I got myself out of that hole, and I see where I'm now. And it's like for me, it's. I've just finished making a film with no budget, no funding. Again, another film. I've made another, I've spent six years of my life working on a film with no budget to make an hour 20 film about penitent, about a man seeking forgiveness of themselves. And that's what the film was about. And when I, 
when I look at that, I don't lose because I thought at one point I'm never going to finish this film, but I had I kept the faith inside and I keep the faith in humanity that the fact that the younger generation, if you speak to them, and I'm working with them on a building site at the moment, I'm on a building site and I'm they don't buy into this shit. They live in, they, they just find another way around it, Chris. They just, they, they just, they have, and when I was chat, I was working with this young 18 year old, and he goes, I said, do you know about 9 11? He goes, no, he don't care. He, the thing, my East, I said, do you know about, he goes, no. <laughs> it was just so nice to speak to that. I said, what are you going to give? Don't know, don't care. Like, but just, we don't, we just find a way around it, like we did. It's, I think, what, it's the birth of the new 90s. These kids, these younger generations, just find another way. And guess what? They're going to be the ones running the show in a minute. And they're going to remember this lockdown. They're going to remember this bullshit, right? And they ain't buying it. So I, I have faith, because I'm chatting to a lot of the younger lads. I have faith in the next generation that they're going to they're gonna come out swinging. And, and so I, I don't... I, I have a secret. I have a secret side to be inside that the smart, big smile inside is saying, "Do you know what? You know what? Do you know? What, do you know the great thing that came out about the Iraq War, Chris? For me, yeah, go cool. on. Is when they tried to push Syria a few years ago, they just got fucked off. It got fucked off. The war got fucked off because the people have had enough. They don't want to see coffins coming back at Woot and Bassett. They don't want to see it. They don't want it. The public don't want it anymore." And the thing is, it's the boy that cried wolf. And the thing is, they played their ace card again, right? So if you look at it that way, there's only so many times you can play your ace card. There's only times you can tell lies, because we've all, we've all been done it. And what you've got to do is you've got to let this play out. You've got to let people lose their freedoms. You've got to let people, that's the way I'm trying to, inside, let people lose their civil liberties. Let people lose, you've got to lose it to then realise it, and then just claim it back. Yeah, Nothing but if you, if you lose it to the extent that, that we're losing it at the rate we're losing it at the same time as people don't have the confidence to speak out, right? Right. And you're doing it. You're, you're doing it now, aren't you? And it's, yeah, it's getting it. I'm, I'm, we have secret meetings with people that, that, that we speak to that we you know, like what we call normal people, right? You don't buy, you don't buy into it. And the thing is, you do, what did my boy say to me once at school? I said I was getting problems with certain people. Um, certain people were, were behaving in a certain way. And my son said to me one day again, that some people were being horrible to me. Or like, uh, I was, and, I, and my son goes, Dad, do you know what I do at school when people are being not horrible to me? And he went, I just go and play with someone else. And I just thought, oh God, that's the metaphor there. Is you just connect yeah. with the people that you do connect with. And that's the thing, if you don't, you, you become the, the five people that you surround yourself with. So if you surround yourself with arseholes, guess what you become? An arsehole. You know, well, the thing I've learned over life, this is the thing, three categories people break into, right? And you can take this quote from me, right? There's three types of souls in life. There's new souls, and new souls, I believe, come to this planet. You, they're, they're young, they're fresh, they learn, they grow. They're, they're, we help those new souls. You've got old souls, right? And old souls are people um, that we learn from, we take their experiences, we, so, we listen to them because they're wise sages. And then you've got arseholes, and there's nothing you can do with an arsehole. Just fuck it all. <laughs> Three types of souls. New souls, old souls, and arseholes. And you're an old soul. And the thing is, you've got that wisdom to give, and you're giving it out. And that's, that's yeah, all mate, you can I, do. I, I, that, I don't have an issue with that. I mean, that's what I do all day long. I associate with like-minded people. Um, you know, we know where we're at. There's no, you know, because we know where we've come from. It, it is what it is. Why, we, why it do you is. think, why do you think I always ask everyone, have you been through trauma? Because I know if the answer is yes, and they've been through the turmoil, whether it's addiction or, or what you've been through and come out the other side, I know they then have the power to see this agenda. And un yeah, it, makes totally. us, it makes us unique. Uh, but when you go... Let's not say any of the, please don't say any of the words because you'll be my, like my first guest that I've asked not to that actually doesn't, right? Every guest, I, I plead not to say the words. And, and then no, no, just, I get that. Yeah, right? I get that. But let's just say you went in a, in a certain place at the moment and, and everyone was like behaving in a certain way, but you were the only one that wasn't. I mean, you, like in some sort of, future fantasy world that will smith would star in right i'm talking it's that weird right i've had my son with me on 
uh, three occasions when let's just say uh, a person in a position of responsibility, uh, um, you, you, know, you know what I'm trying to say, has come over and challenged me uh, I, uh, four times. Twice it's ended up with me getting ejected with my little boy from the establishment. Mm. Twice it's just turned around with me <clears throat> saying, uh, uh, under what under what legal basis, right? Do you do you, do you do you understand the, the the discrimination laws in this country? What you're what you're asking me for, you're not allowed to mm. ask me, right? What do they do? They fuck off because they realise they're muppets, you know. But I had it. I had it in Tesco yeah, every week. I had but, it, I had but mine. Tesco. Just let me finish my point. My point is, if I was like in this certain place, and mm. let's say. 75 people were, were doing the thing, but there was 25 going, fuck that shit. No, no, my, my children are more important. I'm a fucking warrior. I'm a hero to, to my children. I, I care yeah. about their future. I'm not letting them be, be enslaved by this, um, right? But then I'd be like, with you? Yeah, it's, it's you know, there. But, but the fact that, that those people exist I don't think it's as much as 25 as although we'd like like to think so because we live in a bit of an echo chamber with fellow similar minds so yeah it, it fools us at thinking uh that like you know there's loads of us that think like this but but the thing is the fact that there are some but they're all doing the thing they're all doing the thing right they are the cowards because they know it's wrong but they still do it anyway because they're afraid and this is the thing. Until we can get to the bottom of what is it that keeps people in that fear? What is it about our education system that keeps people left brain creatures for life? The vast majority, I'm talking 99%, right? Nine, you, you say we won't go and invade so and so because they, they'd cry. Well, I, I only have to look out the window and see it's just a continuation of the. The, the, you know that you ever that saying you've been letting people have their journey you know it's like it's, it's like you know like i've got to a place in my life now where i've had to learn to i've been out recently and, and my, my partner says to me don't let it wind you up <laughs> so don't let it wind you up and because I, I totally hear where you're coming from i totally follow that so i have to practice on a regular basis breathing techniques all that stuff to the way I, i've it's almost like going through life with a spacesuit on and, not, and then it's trying to go, well, what do I, every time, every time I get a situation that rubs me up the wrong way and I totally hear where you're coming from and I totally feel the way you feel, felt about certain, where I had a confrontation with in Tesco, it was only about a month, two months ago where I walked you in. You said the word. Did I? We weren't going to say the words. Okay. Go on, mate, Conf go on. I think that. Can edit that one up? No, it's just, it's, Mate, the other day I put a video out and I purposely put in what I had to edit out of it just to pass it on some of these platforms, right? Just to show people the agenda that we're under. You're not allowed to talk yeah, yeah. about this, you're not allowed to talk about this, not allowed to talk about this, not allowed to talk about this, not allowed to talk about, right? All of those, whichever platform on the internet you are on, you cannot, right? No. What what happened to freedom of speech? That is our inalienable right. You know, what happened it will, to uh, fighting against tyranny? What yeah. happened to to you know what happened to exchanging information? Because sometimes you're going to be wrong. Sometimes you're going to be ah. What's that? What's that saying? Is is don't don't hate the players. Love the game. Don't hate the game. Love the game. Hate hate the players. <laughs> it's, it's just got a box clever. And that's what you're doing. And that's the thing, isn't it? It's, like, it's, it's get back into enjoying it. It's just a game. It's, what was it what Bill Hicks said? It's just a ride. Is it something what Bill Hicks said? Yeah, it's just a ride. But our kids now can't just hop on a plane and go and try backpack the world like I did. No. You know? Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Well, Not yet. The, the, you know, there will be things, measures. What in happens place. when you stop people doing something? What happens when you stop people doing what? What happens when you tell your kids, right, don't do this, don't do this? What do they do? 
It's not just that, mate. My child now has to grow up in a world with a completely distorted view of what illness is, right? I'm not saying anything more on that. I'm just saying, Mm -hmm. what about uh, going to the gym, eating alkaline diet, being healthy, breathing exercise, all of that stuff has been shared. They're learning, but your your son is learning from you. That's what you've got to remember. You're you learn off your parents you don't learn you learn a little bit from school you learn a little bit from yeah but i'm not, I'm not talk, i'm not just talking about my son mate am i i'm talking about all the children and most of them are in the 99 percent. they're not going to get this info they're going to get the but, fear-based propaganda um, but, are you, but they're not watching they're not watching the mainstream the people that are watching the mainstream is our parents generations that they're, they're watching the mainstream they're right, getting you, for that. you fill me with a bit with a bit of hope <laughs> You've got, I'm, ta- I'm telling you, I'm working on a building site at the moment, 18 to 21 year olds, right? They are having the time of their life. And like every morning when I'm going in, on the, I've said, what's happened last night? What have you been doing? They, 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 <laughs> they are doing, they are doing everything we did in the 90s and more, right? Because they've got a way of connecting with the internet. And when they go on this Snapchat stuff, there's no, the, the Snapchat can't be monitored apparently. By, so they've got ways of doing stuff that, I said, because they were like, the other day, like they were doing stuff and they were, I said, what are you doing there? They said, oh, we're putting, I said, you're putting that on social media. They went, no, Snapchat, it can't be monitored. They, they find a way, Chris, they'll find a way. That's what's beautiful about life. You can't control it. What happens with nature when you try to control it? All right, it, can it, I, it I'm going to bring it back then, because I know people listening, they get, they, this is validity for them. This, these kind of conversations is what we've been denied for our whole lives due to the the establishments that that we've both been talking about. So here's the thing, right? I don't want for anything. Money can't make me happy. I've got everything in life I've ever dreamed about and I've achieved everything that I ever wanted to, right? Um, So basically, I say this a lot, but I live in paradise every day, okay? It could be so easy, mate, than rather to be having these conversations, which if you're a trauma, if you've experienced trauma in your life, it just triggers it all, you know, this confrontation, uh, all this kind of stuff is just like you're walking down a fiery path with people sticking spears into you for 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 telling the truth, right? Burn the heretics. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> for, for telling the truth, right? So, mate, I easily could go and sit in my back garden, bit of sun on my face, reading amazing books that my friends have written. It's Mark Wilkinson. Yeah. Hey, Mark, you got a shout out, mate. DJ Mark Wilkinson. Right? Don't forget to get this bad boy in. This is for your coffee table. <laughs> oh, wow. Let's get, we'll, we'll get a link for that. Soldier of consequence. Right. Here's another one. Look. Yeah. Have I got time to read this? This is sent to me by a publisher for a, for a guest on the show. I'd yeah. love to sit in my garden, mate. Read it. Here, right. It's Sunday. I'm working, right? Um, so what I'm trying to say is I can, I don't have the, the anger, right? I don't, I'm not angry with the BBC. I understand who they are and what, what they function in this matrix. Right. Yeah. I, I, I get it. Um, I could, you know, go and just go to the beach for the day. Well, whatever, whatever the scenario is, um, um, but my thing mate, is to me that would make me selfish to 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 peel away from what's going on and not try to open people's eyes as to the reality that they're living in and yeah. thus, and thus free our young future generations of this slavery that that's that well you know it's uh, what did you what, what did you think of Penitent? Because you, you watched Penitent, didn't you? Yes, I did, mate. Yeah. Because not many people have seen it. I've only shown it to like what 30 people. Yeah, it so f- 
friends at home penitent uh, i think we should keep this short now martin because otherwise we're, uh, uh, yeah 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 i think we've gone on for three hours and and you can edit it down whatever whatever you want well, to use. we don't i don't tend to do that to be honest just only when we, when we go and make a cup of tea but uh yeah great film martin's made um penitent it's about a guy that let's just say fuck, fucks up in combat um, and his colleagues get killed. And then when he comes back to the UK, he's living with the guilt and the shame and the the trauma of seeing them executed and, and this kind of thing. Don't mention the spoiler, though, that's in the film, don't you? <laughs> OK, I will mention the spoiler. Um, and it's powerful. It talks about the journey of emancipation, the one that we've all taken. Uh, it's very similar for all, you know, you go through the, the anger, the, the, the drugs, the alcohol, what, whatever it might be, the, the detachment from your relationships, from your family, the, this lack of, the, the frustration that people just don't, you know, get it, this kind of thing. And then it also introduces what I call the angels. And I, I'm not saying that to sound fluffy, just on my journey, there, there was there was two of them, right? Two people when when everyone else left my life, everyone. But actually, I'm going to say three. Three people that had the, the integrity or the sense of self to come out and say, "Chris, you're a good guy," right? That's that's all they needed to say in this mm-hmm. quagmire of, you know. What, what, what they actually say is, like, you're a good guy. You don't need to be doing this shit to yourself. You no. don't need to be doing just, just... So I call them the angels. And that, that you know, we spoke about it. If I say the French man, we, we, we understand that in your, in your film. Did you... Did you the, Fre- the Frenchman, Guy, who plays the actor, he, he, he's, he was really, I told him your feedback the other day and he was moved by that. And I yeah, said how important... We're friends now. <laughs> Oh yeah, he's he's a lovely bloke to interview. He's yeah. really nice. And again, Mark Ryan as well. He was in um, he, he was the he was in Who Dares Wins because I saw your recent podcast about Who Dares Wins. He was he played the the uh, terrorist in um, Who Dares Wins. He gets shot by the SES team when they come into the house. Um, and he knew Lewis Collins. And I, I think we should finish up just by me congratulating you on 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 just all of it. You know. Oh, thanks, man. I appreciate that. Just all of it, and it and it's all good. Nothing is bad. Uh, as I'm always saying, we don't live in the past. We only go. We only go forward. Um, I think there'll be more to this chat. We we should do. Definitely, mate. We should do do. We definitely do more because it. It's. Uh, I'm happy to talk about the therapy side some other time with the PTSD because. Yes. It might save some lives. That's why I've been If you've just one person saves one person's life, they get help, you know, because yeah. the therapy stuff, you know, because, you know, I do, I do still have PTSD. I thought I didn't have PTSD. I thought I'd got rid of it. I thought, I'd, but I do still suffer from PTSD. And that's been, you know, for the last year, it's been problematic for me. But I do feel I'm in a lot better place to deal with my situation and the penitent coming out if it saves one life as well, when you watch that film, if it stops somebody from taking their life, getting help and then sorting themselves out, then it was worth making, you know? Um, I, got, I got kidnapped as a child. Did you? Yeah. So, albeit for like two hours, but during that two hours, what, what they were trying to do to me and my sister wasn't, you know. It's frightening. What age were you then? Oh, God. Six, six or maybe seven, and then then that that sets it up I, for the rest I, of your life. I give you to give you and I to people at home an idea of, of like the trauma uh, the traumas I went through. I once got attacked by a dog, like a feral sheep dog on a farm. Yeah, me and my mates have been playing on this this rope swing out in the in the nature. And this dog had come up and befriended us and it loved it. And we were throwing sticks and it was, it was a dog, right? My friends all left to go home and I'm still there swinging on this stick. 
and um, the dog came up and I thought it's, you know, just attacked me, mate, right? Just jumped up, got his uh, fangs into my scalp. And I could feel it just clamping down on me and it was, Arr! and like, obviously I'm in shock. Obviously it, it's just, you know, further trauma. I went home. I didn't even tell my parents. Not, not because I was trying to hide any. No, no. I, it, I didn't know that when stuff like that happens to you, you should tell your parents about it. And they, they'll go, oh, come on, and they'll make it better. That, that wasn't in my life, you know. That internalization of such traumas from such a young age, it, I, I can do, I didn't have the skills to process it. Right. So it's gone in there. It's gone into the, you know, it's 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 not even compartmentalized in my mind. It's in a place that. As an adult now, I have the ability to address it, you know, to put measures in place so it doesn't control my life. Right. Uh -huh. um, control my behaviors This like, you know, the drinking and all, all this kind of stuff. Um, but you say, I think, with Peter, it's, it's, I, I think it's in us, mate, and, and it's okay, you know, it's okay. It, it's, I, I think we, if uh, people say God's chosen ones, I think we're Mother Nature's chosen ones because we, we get given a gift off the back of this, and it's a gift only, only you and I understand, you know, and others understand. And I mean, yeah, it may, maybe other people do that haven't been to, through such trauma and that's just great credit to them. Probably had really good parents, I'm guessing. Um, yeah. Most people are oblivious. They call us names. They, they you know, they alienate us from, so they, they use words like uh, smackhead and crackhead and, Alky and 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 drunk and and uh, tramp and bum and and all these things because they don't get it, you know. If you don't feel, it, if you find that place inside your heart where it doesn't matter what anyone calls you, you know. I mean, look, I, I I've got disgraced soldier written on my. I mean, I mean where people go, do you feel <coughs> that? No, because it used to bother me, but now because I don't feel a disgraced soldier, I just look at it. It's just, it's just, a, it's just a. Doesn't mean shit. Doesn't mean anything to me because I know yeah, who I am. I know I'm a good but We know it's a badge of honor. That's why I've got psychosis, <laughs> crystal meth psychosis on the front of my book yeah. because it's the proudest thing that ever happened to me. The same as your experience should be the proudest thing that ever happened to you. And and, and to anyone watching this, go out, write a book, make a film, do do express it because what by doing that you're inspiring others to to um to overcome whatever it is they want to overcome, you know, and becoming the master of their own destiny. That's the thing, that master your own destiny and being at peace for yourself and forgiving. Let go of the rope. That's the biggest thing I learned. I didn't see my kids for three years and uh, I had to go to court and whatnot. When I stopped going to court, let go of the rope, stop fighting, I got to see my kids again. And it's that's, there's a massive, powerful message in that. If you, if you fight, if you want to tug a war with someone, what happens? You get calluses, you get rope burns. If you let go of the rope, what happens to the what happens to the people on the other side? They all fall over, don't they? Yes. And it. We'll we'll continue this on another one. We'll we'll do we'll do part two. We'll do a therapy one. We'll talk about all therapy stuff and that that we both understand and have been through. Yes. So, Martin, I'm going to let you get back to your sun bed because I can I can see you're missing it. No. Yeah. Thank you very much, mate. And, and as you say, let's pick this up again. To friends at home, if you could please like and subscribe um, and support these kind of conversations, because this, this is for our children's future, isn't it? You know, the, these are the conversations that they've just not taken place until, and, until now. And it's, uh, you know, <laughs> someone has to have them. Someone has to listen to them and, People have to invest invest in it. So if you could like and subscribe, that'd be great. Much love to you all.
See you soon. Namaste. <laughs> Cheers, buddy.